my workflow is that I sort of get some ideas down, maybe just using the built-in mic as I'm walking around. Then when I get back, I'll just plug into my interface, hook up a condenser mic, and then I can record my vocals, record my acoustic guitar, and it all stays 100% in my iOS device. I could be doing my mixing or my final mastering, I disconnect from my studio and walk out the door and go for a walk and just be listening to my mix, but making real-time adjustments as I'm walking around. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro-sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, FreeSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master masterbundle.com to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Hey Rockstars, it's your host Lid Sean. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Pete Johns a singer-songwriter, recording enthusiast, and music educator from Adelaide, South Australia. Pete played in bands and dabbled in recording in the 90s before a full-time career and family put music on the back burner. But 20 years later, Pete started getting back into writing, playing, and recording music, starting out using Cakewalk and eventually Reaper to record on his PC before discovering that he could record directly on his mobile device. Since falling in love with mobile music creation, Pete has since released nine singles, an EP, and in 2018 released his first full-length album, Selfish Aware, all recorded 100% in GarageBand on iPhone and iPad. While recording in GarageBand, Pete became frustrated with the lack of tutorials and instruction videos online that focused on mobile recording, especially using iOS, so he started his own website, blog, and YouTube channel, Studio Live Today. Pete has since created more than 400 videos focused on helping folks who want to create, record, and release their own music. And Pete now produces a new video every day documenting his songwriting and recording processes, as well as providing tips and tutorials, and is committed to helping others reignite their passion for music and release their best music. Now, I knew Pete was a fan of recording studio rock stars back when he was one of the first rock stars to pick up a recording studio rock stars (laughs) t-shirt. That's a lot of recording studio rock stars in one sentence. And then and then Pete sent me a selfie rocking his new shirt from I it was like either from your home studio or from the beach in Australia. And yeah, you down the beach. Up, yeah, you got a you got a really awesome purple one, which was great. That's it. Um, but more recently, I reconnected with you, Pete, when I learned you had started your YouTube channel and then saw that you were also getting more than a hundred thousand views for some of your iPhone videos. And I, of course I was super intrigued. Today, I'm excited to talk to you, Pete, about how we can make records on our iPhones, iPads, and mobile devices, which is really remarkable, considering that I remember my first cell phone back in 1999, when the only thing it was good for was calling your friend to talk about how you were calling him on your new cell phone. (laughs) (laughs) So please welcome Pete Johns, the recording studio rock stars. Pete, are you ready to rock, dude? I am ready to rock and roll. It's great to be here, sir. Dude, I'm glad to have you on the show, man. I'm really glad to reconnect with you. And again, just so impressed to see what you created. I remember, you know, when you launched your YouTube, 
I remember connecting with you at that point and seeing that you were making a couple of new videos. And like, I was like, oh, that's cool. And then recently I went back and looked and you've just been on fire making all these great videos to show people, you know, how to make music from something as simple as your iPhone. You know, I think sometimes we get caught up in this idea that we need to have like a super complex studio, but um, tell us, tell us how you got into all that and tell us, tell us more about your start with music. Yeah, so uh, I guess my story is pretty typical of, of a lot of folks in that uh, I played in bands and I played guitar and, and tried to rock out in the 90s. I, I remember my first uh, you know, Tascam Porter Studio, like the old four-track tape machine that oh, I, yeah. I would uh, try to record on, uh, but not very successfully, but uh, it sort of got me started. And then, like most people, uh, unless you're going to have a career in music, uh, life happens and you know, you've got bills to pay, you got mortgage, you got family commitments. So music tends to kind of just take a bit of a backseat, and, and that's what happened with me. Uh, and it took probably 20 years till I was in my, my mid thirties before I actually picked up and went, ah, it's actually kind of ridiculous that I'm not still writing and recording music. And by that stage, technology had, uh, caught up significantly and I started getting into, as I said, to Cakewalk, as you mentioned. And then, um, I got into Reaper, uh, on my PC, uh, John Tidy, who I think has been a, a guest on yeah. your, your podcast here, a uh, really great guy, uh, absolute expert on Reaper. So, uh, yeah, he got me into, into Reaper pretty heavily. And then it was, it, I was sort of checking out my iPad on my iPhone one day and I'm like, this garage band icon here, it's always intrigued me. I'm like, can how, how could I record just using my phone? That seems a bit crazy. So I you know, jumped in there and started playing around and like, hey, I can I can make a cool beat. You know, you can use the virtual instruments. But then I'm like, what if I what if I hook up my guitar? What if I hook up a microphone? Like, how can I use this? How can I sort of make this my recording door of choice. So uh, I went on to YouTube back in the day. Uh, YouTube was sort of just sort of heating up there. And I'm like, someone must be creating content for YouTube about how to do this. And no one really was. Uh, GarageBand had been on the Mac for quite a long time, but it was quite new to, to iOS. So I'm like, well, I, I got to teach myself. And as I'm learning and as I'm teaching myself, I'm like, you know what? There's got to be other folks out there just like me who want to create music, who just have an iPhone or an iPad and want to get started. How cool will it be to sort of share my experience? And hopefully other folks can pick up. And, yeah. and like you said, when we when we first connected, there were you know maybe a hundred other people that were like, yeah, that, that's a pretty cool thing to do. And little did I know that yeah, there are so many people out there that are just you know they have they have songs inside them, they want to record them, but they don't have a studio, they don't have a they don't have a PC, they don't have all this gear, they just want to get started. So that yeah. was kind of my inspiration for the channel. And and yeah, that's that's where I am today. Well, so I, I, I want to preface this too um, for the rock stars listening. Now, you know, obviously, a lot of times, you know, the the beginning of the intro. We're talking about professionals in the studio. And so, you know, if anybody's scratching their head and going, wait a minute, what's this have to do with doing it on your iPhone? Um, what I really love about your story, Pete, is, you know, you, you self-admittedly talk about going, you know, being into music, going and, and doing something for your career to support your family. But, you know, you still got a passion for music and you want to come back yeah. and record with it. And, you know, for one reason or another, maybe it it's you know, for a lot of people, it's it's time constraints that are daunting, but also sometimes it's just this feeling that like you can't really record unless you've got something complex and complicated. And, you know, yet your story of like revisiting all this with your iPhone and you're making these great songs and great recordings. And I love that video that you shared where <laughs> you've sort of like positioned yourself on the overstuffed chairs and the couch and, and you do the overdubs. We got, how did you do that? Well, first of all, what was that song and how did you make that video? Because it's super cool. Yeah, so that, that's my song, Anxiety. So that was actually uh, a song that I recorded uh, on four tracks. So uh, Joe Gilder, Home Studio Corner, again, I, I know you know Joe. Uh, yeah. He's a really cool guy. Uh, he did a, a four-track challenge, and I'm like, i, I got to get into this because I, you know, I started on a four-track, and I wanted to record uh, record music. So I actually recorded that on just four tracks with my uh, with an acoustic guitar and just vocals uh, and a bit of hand percussion in there. And uh, it was uh, when I actually went to to shoot the video, I was like, uh, so the song is the song's called Anxiety, and you know, it's a, it's about, uh, you know, not surprisingly, anxiety. You know, a lot of creative <laughs> folks sort of tend to tend to struggle a bit with that. But it's a, it's a positive story about how you know you can overcome things and how you can can uh, can uh, cope with these sort of things. But uh, when I wanted to shoot the video, I I, uh, I shot it. I had set up my camera and uh, I used a technique where you sort of cut your your camera into four. Uh, so you got the one static background and there's four videos. And then in editing, you sort of bring those four together. So there's there's four peats on a couch, which my wife says is far too many. She's like, it's hard <laughs> enough dealing with one of you. We don't want 
want four of you. So uh, yeah, so the four the four Pete's on the couch and the the story of the video, if you check it out, is yeah that there's four of me at the start and then I'm talking to myself. Like that's the whole thing. It's all about self talk and yeah, not to get too too deep into it, but the whole thing about uh, you know dealing with yourself is sometimes you can get up in your own head uh, and that you know the point of the song is to say that. Yeah, sometimes you just need to silence those voices, be your own positive voice, and that's where at the end of the video I get rid of all the other peeps and we're left with just me there uh, making music on the couch. So nice, nice. yeah, it's a, it was it was a, a really fun song to make, and uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of people have connected with it, which is which is really really flattering. So let, let me dig into some of the details because obviously on this show we get to ask the really geeky questions about like how exactly <laughs> did you do that? So. It sounds like um, when I watched it, I'm thinking maybe you did the four track recording of the song first, yeah. and then with the with the video camera, you sort of did a uh, you know like a um, lip sync, you know, traditional music video style. Um, yep. Okay, great. And then you just put your camera on a tripod, uh, and camera's probably just your iPhone, right? Uh, well, that was yeah. That, that was actually my 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 SLR. But uh, I, I've actually interesting story, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later. I've, I've gone a bit more lo-fi. I've switched back to my iPhone for most of my videos now. But uh, yeah, that was just my my camera on a tripod. Uh, you set up, and yeah, the, the old lip syncing. So yeah, I felt a bit crazy. Uh, I was glad I was at, at home alone doing it because if anyone watched me, they would have seen a, a strange guy sitting in the chair wearing different outfits and, and singing, miming to his own song. Uh, but yeah, it was it was fun to do. And then uh, yeah, it was just a matter of hooking it up. So I recorded the track they play back the track and, and synced up the the audio and the video and then yeah there's uh, uh in most video editing software you can kind of crop the sides so all it was is it's just it's four strips and if you watch very closely a lot of people have picked up on this they're like yeah the lighting's a little bit different in some of those strips right, because right, right. uh yeah dealing dealing with lighting as you know from doing video is like yeah you try to get the lighting exactly the same on every shot and you can't do it so uh yeah it, it, it was interesting and a fun process but um yeah a, a lot of folks have actually asked how did you make the video and they want a tutorial now, not only about the music, but about how to shoot that video as well. Right. So, well, uh, yeah, it's well, totally. And I, and I dig that because again, it's just that reminder that like, we're, we're doing all this stuff because it's fun, you know, cause like we want to yeah. be creative and, and be expressive and just do something fun, or at least that's why I like to do it. And, um, you know, making music in your studio is part of that, but also just doing cool shit, like making a cool video to go with it. I mean, like Raise yeah. your hand if you've made your own music video. I, I have yet to make my own music video. So I applaud you for doing that and not letting, you know, complicated technology get in the way. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's pretty much been, uh, and I'll, we'll talk about this more when we talk in more detail, but it, it's kind of been the focus of my music, but also my life of the last few years is that just just get in and start doing things. Like we, we do a lot, like especially creative types, we do a lot of thinking, a lot of analyzing, a lot of determining what we should and shouldn't do. Uh, I've learned over time that the best thing to do is just to try it and to do it, to embrace the failure if you do fail, uh, but yeah, just get up and try again and just keep doing new things and eventually you'll find the things that that work for you and that, that work for other people as well if, you, if you're trying to help other people out. So don't be afraid to, to put yourself out there and, and push push out of your comfort zone every now and then because, yeah, you'll be amazed at what you can actually do and you being everyone uh, if you just you know put your mind to it and just start things. Well, totally. It's like hindsight is so much better than foresight. You know, hindsight at least means you just did something and you're just looking back yep. on it to decide, you know, how you're going to do it better next time. Um, I like to so, ask guests also on the show to share an inspirational quote to kind of kick us off and get us to hit the studio. And I wonder if you had anything you wanted to share with us. Yeah, I do. And, and look, it's it's actually directly related to what I was just talking about. So, uh, and it's something that I don't even know where I heard it and I don't even know who to credit for it. But it's, uh, it's this is when you don't know where to start, just start. So. Yeah. What that means is if if you are – a lot of us sort of go, oh, I'm going to plan how to do this and I'm going to work out exactly what I'm going to do. Then I'm going to get my strategy down. And like I, I would record an album except, you know, I've got to get all this stuff done first. It's like if you don't know where to start and you're feeling overwhelmed, just – go for it. Just pick up a guitar and start strumming. Just hit the record button and start recording because whatever you get out there is something and it's better than nothing. So I think people are, are often afraid of, of starting because they're like, what if it's not perfect? What if it's not great? Well, I'm going to tell you, my first song was crap. Like the first thing you're going to record in any platform at any time, it's not going to be that good because you got to learn. Yeah, everyone starts yeah. at zero. So your first one is going to be your first one. And then as you move on, you're only going going to improve because you're going to learn what worked and what didn't work from what you did before. So that's what I like to tell folks where they're like, oh, I, I want to start, but I'm nervous. I'm like, just start. 
Like, start doing what? Like, I don't care. Just start doing whatever's going to work for you and see what happens and, and just go with the flow. And, and that tends to work and, and get the, the juices flowing. And then, you know, you just keep, keep going from there. So that reminds me um, of one of my favorite authors back in my 20s. I haven't read him in a long time, but Henry Miller. And he, mm-hmm. he talked about how new authors, you know, when they, when they decided they were going to write their first book, they just universally would always, you know, blow it up in their minds as this big, great masterpiece that they were going to do. Mm-hmm. And it was always a pile of shit. And it was never yeah. any good. <laughs> and that like his advice is the same thing. It was like, the first thing you got to do is you just got to get that first novel out there so yep. you can move on to the second one. And, and then, if, then you start to like, you know, really write a masterpiece at some point if you do it long enough. Hopefully, yeah, yeah, totally. And and, and I think it, uh, another thing I often say is that like people are like, oh, I want to write, I want to record a record, and yeah, that, that can be daunting. Everyone's like, yeah, I, I want to, I've got an album in me. Or the same with writing a novel. You want to write a novel? It's like you know what, write a short story first, or write a, an article. And it's the same with music. Like, don't write an album, write an EP, or release a single. Or you yeah. know what, write a thirty second jingle. Pretend you're in advertising and you're you're writing a thirty second song or a theme song for a podcast, or just make something up. But don't make it overwhelming. Chunk it down and do something small so that you can learn. And then you can build up to it. Like it took me a few years before I got to you know, record an album uh, because, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Like trying to write you know, 10 plus songs and mix them and master them, like that's that's overwhelming. So don't put that out as your first thing to do. Chunk it down and start simple. Well, you know, or you could do like I did just recently and just go ahead and book a recording session with a drummer yeah. and a bass player and, you know, uh, you know, that you're paying money for and then yeah. just – decide to find out how many if you have any songs that are ready for it as it <laughs> as it creeps up on you which worked out in my case I it turned out that I you know I was able to pick five and the funniest thing it's just like you said man I picked five songs and I was like is that enough you know <laughs> maybe mm. I need to work on some other words and then I was like nah I'll just wait and see sure enough mm. we we barely squeaked through five songs in two long ass days in the studio you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's totally true. And, you know, I've heard, I've heard some of those songs and they they are killer. So uh, you, you did something right, but uh, I love that as well because you're right that uh, you know, especially when you've got either time pressure, so you're giving yourself some sort of time commitment that I'm doing this by then, or you've got you know cash on the line. As soon as you throw down cash to do something, uh, or you've yeah. booked other people's time, it's amazing how quickly you can go and and just step up and do things. So yeah, no, I love I love that as well. Well, you know, the other thing that was beneficial for me too was realizing as I, as I book these guys. So um, the drummer is uh, Daniel Sauls, aka DJM, mm-hmm. and Emma Lambiasi, um, the, a incredible bass player. Um, yeah. And so the two of them, I booked them. And then as it got close, I was like, wait a minute, these guys are really good musicians. <laughs> I realized I was like, I don't think I know how to play my own songs yet. I just, I kind of sketched yeah. them out and I recorded them, but I don't know how to actually play and sing. So it, you know, it really inspired me to start rehearsing and and get good enough to actually track in a session with them. But yeah, very cool. Let, let's jump forward. So, um, you know, uh, you know, here's a couple of questions that I that are on our question list. But I like to ask also if you want to share a story about an important failure. Um, maybe there was something along the way for you where you were trying to you know make your studio too complex before you decided <laughs> to simplify it and go with your iPhone. Um, do you have any stories like that you want to share with us? Uh, I absolutely do. So yeah, it, it's it, exactly what you're saying there, and, and I sort of alluded to it at the start of uh, the start of the interview, which is that I, I did. I tried to make things uh, too complex, and I'm I'm a, an information junkie and a bit of a technology nerd as well. So when I get into something, I get into it like. All, all guns blazing. So I wanted to go out there and I wanted to get a studio set up. I wanted to to have the interface and I wanted to have the, the DAW and all the templates set up. And what I found is that when I started out, so I, I mentioned I just got Kate Walk on my PC and I'm like, ah, oh, what do I do? Oh, let's just plug in a mic, hit record and see what happens. The the songs I got there weren't great, but they were. I was pretty proud of them. What sort of happened over the next probably year was that I went on a bit of a, an information overload. So, and it's a good thing. Like information is a great thing. So I watched a heap of videos, tutorials, courses, your stuff, Joe Gilder, Graham Cochran, all of these guys that taught me really good things. But what I was doing is I was spending 95% of my time watching tutorials and learning and like 5% actually applying. And I think that's the biggest failure and the biggest lesson I've learned now is that 
you need to focus on the doing and it's really good to learn stuff. And it's a bit weird for me because obviously I'd love people to watch my YouTube videos and, and watch my tutorials. But if you yeah. watch any of my videos, I say, look, I'm really focused on helping you create, record and release your best music as in the person watching and uh, get to the end of the video. What I want you to be thinking at that point is awesome. I'm going to grab my guitar. I'm going to grab my keyboard. I'm going to grab my microphone. I'm going to go away and record now. I'm not going to sit down and say, oh, I wonder what another person has to say about this same topic. It's too easy to get overloaded and overwhelmed, and that's what I find and found. And it wasn't until I sort of grabbed GarageBand and went, I'm just going to, like I did with that song Anxiety, I'm going to get four tracks. It's just me. It's acoustic guitar. It's vocals. i got to see what I can do with four tracks and just what I can play with my voice and my hands. And that's where I sort of got over that, and the, and, and the learning from that was, was huge. Yeah, that's awesome. And of course, Rockstars, I suggest that you spend 95% of your time listening to this podcast and the other 95% of your time creating your record. And then that last 5% is maybe just for sleeping. I don't know. You can do whatever you want with it. But um, yeah, no, that's encouraging. And um, again, you know, like one of the songs you had a video of, another song was the song Lucky. Um, mm. And that I think that was the one where you're sort of like, you, you sort of almost did it vlog style and you're in the airport yeah. traveling and everything. And I, I don't know what you do for a day job, but I imagined, I'm like, here's a guy who's like writing a song and he's using the very, you know, thing that is part of just a, a day job routine or maybe you're traveling for work or something like that. And you yeah. turn it into a vlog. And I'm like, that's cool. You know, write about what who you are and what's normal in your life and just make that your creative expression. Yeah, totally. And, and and I'm I'm pretty proud of that song because yeah, it was it was literally literally written on a plane and recorded in on GarageBand on my phone on a plane and then I recorded the video while traveling for for my day job. So, uh yeah, it, it, it uh, what I wanted to do with that is just embrace and kind of show folks that even if you don't have a heap of time, like incorporate music into your life. And you know, we'll talk about it a bit more later, but the reason that I love you know, using my phone, using my iPad for creating music is that it's with me all the time. So even every little bit of downtime that you have, you can pick up your phone, you can do a bit of mixing, you can do a bit of recording, you've got a, a melody idea in your head, open up your phone and record it into your voice recorder and then bring it into GarageBand later and play around with it. So it's it's really cool to be able to have that flexibility and yeah, whatever you do. And, and I guess a lot of folks that, that watch my content do have a day job and they maybe have, you know, two hours on a Saturday and a Sunday for recording. So they want to be able to just get in and get quickly started yeah. with their music process. They don't have time to to research and get all the set up and, and that sort of stuff. You don't so, spend your two yeah, hours setting cool. up. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. You want to just grab it and go. So yeah, it's it, it, it's pretty good. And it's encouraging that a lot of other folks are now starting to, to realize, I guess, that uh, yeah, you, you don't need everything. I mean, stu cool studios are cool. You know, I'd, I'd love, if I come to Nashville, I'm, I'm coming to the Toy Box studio and I'm checking out what you nice, got there because I love away. beer and I love stuff. But uh, yeah, at the same time, you can get away with like a lot less than you think you can, especially these days with, with digital recording. Yeah. And, and when you do, please bring your purple t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I will be rocking the uh, the purple recording studio Rockstars t-shirt for sure. So I'll drop in a plug here, Rockstars. If you are interested in getting yourself a t-shirt for recording studio Rockstars or for the Toy Box Studio or for Save Home Studios, um, part of the uh, home studio battle here in Nashville, Tennessee, just go to rsrockstars.com slash t-shirt, just T-S-H-I-R-T, and uh, that'll take you right to the store. All right, enough plugs. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny you talk about uh, working on your iPhone to make music on a plane. I did the exact same thing, dude. Something about mm. like, I mean, it sounds really not great <laughs> because I'm having to crank my headphones up louder than my earbuds louder yeah. than a jet engine. But there's something <laughs> about flying that makes me want to break out my phone uh, and start learning GarageBand and, and making mm. little songs in there. And I tend to do that. So talk about that process. I mean, what what is it like for you when you're like, oh, I'm going to sketch out an idea on my iPhone? Yeah, so it, it is. It's it's um it, it's a really sort of free and liberating experience because wherever I am, and I, I do a lot of walking as well. So you know, here in Australia, it's beautiful right now. It's like middle of summer, so uh, I, I walk around a lot, and I'll just have my phone with me, and I'll be just sketching out ideas, be, being careful not to you know trip over because if I face planted while uh, trying to make a song, that wouldn't be a good look. But uh, yeah, same sort of thing. You're sitting on a plane, you've just got any of those downtime, you can actually just add it. So for me, it, it's about 
I'll normally get an idea down, which is just in my head. So, you know, that thing, you're in the shower, you're walking around, whatever it is, you just get that melody idea. So I'll usually record that just on my camera or just on my voice recorder. And then I'll sort of listen back to that when I've got some time, you know, sitting on a plane or or on a bus or whatever, and then sort of sketch that out. And the beauty part of of an iPhone is you got your little keyboard on there. So you can literally hit record and just play on your touch screen so you can get your your melody idea down. Mm -hmm. Then you can just add in your chords. You can build out your arrangement that way. And you can say, okay, what's this going to be? I'm going to use, a, I'm going to do it in G major. So I'm going to put my chords in there uh, and then, you know, work out your tempo. So by the time you, you know, you get back and I'll get back to my studio, which is you know, fairly humble studio because it's uh, mostly mobile, then I could just sort of sit down and I've already got that idea. And there's something about being, like you say, being on the go and being moving that actually helps sort of kick my brain into gear. I can sit down on my butt uh, for two hours and maybe come out with one idea if I'm lucky. Whereas if I'm just out and about, I'll just come out with idea after idea i'll throw them down and then i've just got this this great little backlog of ideas that when i'm like ah i'm a bit bored what am i going to do i'll go to my phone and pull out an idea and 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 play with it yeah it's really cool so so a couple of thoughts about that one is i think when you're out and about i think one of the reasons ideas come is because you just have constant um you know input uh, sensory Mm. input and things real real world things are happening and stuff's inspiring you whereas when you sit down in the studio and you're like okay and now i'm in this you know um potentially kind of careful environment and I have to come up with something creative to do, sometimes that feels a little daunting. You're like, I don't know what to say or to write yeah. about. So I like that idea of being out, out and about doing that. And then um, the other question I wanted to ask you is when you go back to your home studio, tell us a little bit about your home studio and do you sort of, is your is the iPhone part of the home studio somehow or do you go from one format to another to keep working? How does that work? Yeah, so I, I stay completely on on iOS. So uh, I go from the the iPhone sometimes over to the iPad. So app, Apple devices are pretty cool in that you can airdrop directly from one device to another. So I've got uh, an iPad and a couple of iPhones that I use uh, in my studio. So if I'm out and I've done something on my iPhone, I'll just come back and the project will be there in GarageBand. I'll say airdrop this over to my iPad, and then I've got my bigger screen. So I'll just sit there at the desk. And um, the, the the thing that a lot of not, a lot of folks don't know about recording and on on your phone. Or on your iPad is that you can use all the same gear that you can use on your Mac or your PC. So all you need is a, a lightning to USB connector. So a way to get a USB signal into your phone or your iPad, and you can hook up your mics, your MIDI controllers, your audio interfaces, everything can be connected directly to your phone or your iPad. So my, my process and my workflow is that I sort of get some of my ideas down, maybe just using the built-in mic or just my headset that I'm, as I'm walking around. And then when I get back, I'll just plug into my interface, hook up a condenser mic and then I can record my vocals, record my acoustic guitar and it all stays 100% in my iOS device and that means that I could be doing my mixing or my final mastering and just disconnect from my studio and walk out the door and, and again go for a walk and just be listening to my mix but making real time adjustments to my mix as I'm walking around so wow. uh, that, that's a, it's a really cool way and it really works for me um, and, and a lot of folks at the starting out are, are doing it but what I'm finding now is that even a lot of more experienced folks are starting to to pick in pick up iPhones and iPads, and they're realizing that they have this powerful creation tool and that they can have it with them wherever they go. So I know a lot of folks that travel will just take you know, their, their iPad and they'll take like a, a little app, uh, Apollo interface or a Steinberg interface, uh, you know, a little condenser microphone with them, and then they got like a portable studio with them wherever they go. So yeah, it's, it, it's super cool, and, and I love uh, recording mobile, as you can probably tell. Yeah, no doubt. And and um, I just want to say like, no shit, you can, you can, I can hook my interface up to my iPhone. I've never even tried that or considered that. I guess I've heard about it before, but I've never actually done it. Um, and I know in one of your videos, you talk about a uh, little, uh, the Stein base, uh, Stein, excuse me, Steinberg, um, <laughs> yeah. UR12. I think that was, yeah. that was it. Um, and that one, uh, you said you use the words class compliant, maybe t- give us a little education on what that means, you know, as much as you feel, uh, like you're qualified to do. And, um, what are the things that are likely to work and what are some of the things that you've run into that are not going to work with the iPhone? 
Yeah, so luckily, almost all newer gear, so anything made in like the last five years is class compliant. So what class compliant means is that it doesn't need a separate driver to actually run the hardware. So when you're connecting to your iPad or your iPhone, you can't install a driver. It's not like your, your PC or even your Mac. I know right. Macs are a bit better, they, but they're a bit more plug and play. But PC especially, often you need a driver to actually run your hardware uh, so that it can talk to the software. Whereas in iOS, there is no driver. So most of your devices, so most of the modern uh, uh, audio interfaces, MIDI keyboards, uh, USB microphones are class compliant. Uh, there's a few that aren't. So if you get some of the some of the old, like the, the really old sort of stuff that that uh, was like the very early USB one and USB right. two interfaces. My ancient M box isn't going to work. I was going to say yeah, the it. old M boxes. Yeah. So if you go to go to your thrift store and you, you try to pick up some second hand gear and you plug it in, it'll probably say that nah, fail. But uh, yeah, any, anything that you're buying new or even in, like I say in the last five to ten years is is pretty much going to be class compliant. And a lot of a lot of the gear you're buying now, so Steinberg, who are made by Yamaha, um, they're my favorite sort of interface because they're designed to work with Mac and PC really well. But then there's a switch on the back and you can say, power this from a mobile. So you could use, you know, your little mobile battery banks, like your power banks that you plug your mobile phone into. You can use the same thing with your interface. So I can be on the go and I can have my interface powered by just a little battery and then I can plug that into my my phone and just be recording wherever and when, whenever I like. So uh, yeah, back back to the original question. So class compliant, uh, yeah, just, just check the specs. Uh, it'll actually say iOS compatible or class compliant when you're buying gear. And like I say, almost anything, there's only been the really old gear that I've tried to hook up or really high-end stuff. So as soon as you get into, you know, your, your $1,000 interfaces and, and mixes and that sort of thing, they will need some more drivers to run but if you're you know you're using a steinberg uh, or you know some of the focus right scarlet solos and two i twos a lot of a lot of home studio folks are using uh yeah they work really well and, and like so i say cool. a lot of the a lot of professional recording folks are now saying well hey i could pick up you know a 200 dollar interface and a hundred dollar condenser and then a, a 50 dollar cable and i've got myself a portable studio with just my iphone and i can capture ideas wherever i go in pretty good quality like people are actually pretty blown away by the quality you can get just from uh, your iphone so um, you mentioned on your video uh, when you're talking about the Steinberg UR12, I thought you said something about battery. Does that does that interface actually have a battery pack inside it, or were you just talking about using the external battery to kind of power it? Yeah, just just the external battery. So yeah, just a- any of your your standard little battery packs that you can you can buy off the shelf. Uh, you just plug in. It's just got a micro USB cable, mm-hmm. so you can plug in anything that can power it. You can also plug it into just a, your normal wall socket if you want. If you if you're in the studio, so I do that sometimes too. Uh, and the other the, the other killer thing to mention here is that you can also use a USB hub. So you can basically set up. If you think, oh, I've got to unplug and replug all the time, if you get yourself a little powered USB hub, you can plug in your keyboard, your interface, so you can have a, a guitar a mic and a MIDI keyboard just all plugged in so in my studio all I do is walk in I plug in my phone into its little cable and then I'm hooked up so my MIDI keyboard my interface my microphone they're all just there and I hit record and play and like I say then I just unplug walk out the door and I'm listening to my mix like two seconds later it's it's super cool that's so awesome man I love the way you're describing this I'm gonna I'm gonna dump all my studio gear and just switch to a phone now (laughs) But um, so so the, my first thought when you talk about walking out the studio door and you and you're working on your mix, I love that you can go on a walk and you know you know get ideas about how it's sounding. Now, of course, we're making some judgment calls in headphones when we do that, probably. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, a couple of cool things about this. One is, uh, you know, I consider this. People think I'm crazy for it, but I consider the how how the music sounds coming out of a speaker on your iPhone to be uh, relevant. Um, measure of how your mix is sounding just because mm. so often we hear, you know, pop tunes and and hit songs playing back that way off the iPhone and we get used to that. And, and I like to know that if I'm making a record, it's going to sound similar to that. Um, but then the other thought was the car jam, man, is, is mm. going and taking your music and your new mix to the car part of your process. And have you discovered that because you're going from the iPhone directly, you, you're adjusting this mix? Is that sort of like a, ni- a new secret weapon to getting your mix right. It, it, it absolutely is. And n- not only the car jam, but the, the home stereo jam, the Bluetooth the boombox jam, like o- all of that stuff is so simple because if you think of your iPhone, if you use an iPhone or an iPad, you can hook that thing up to any any Bluetooth speaker, anything that you can plug a, a, a an eighth inch cable and, and output it to, you can hear your exact mix on a whole bunch of stuff. So I know, you know when, when you're working in the home studio, you, you, you mix down your mix and then you've got to transfer it to Dropbox or something. And so then you, you put it on your phone, you take it, you play it, and then 
you're like, okay, now I'm going to make my changes. You're going to re remix it. You're going to re uh, re download it. And yeah, so it takes a lot of effort. Whereas all I do, like you say, I can plug in you know, a pair of decent studio monitor headphones or just my earbuds. I can unplug it to listen to it for the speaker because that's totally legitimate. Like a lot of people are listening to music by just cranking up their phone speaker and listening on that. Um, or I can plug it, like I say, I've got my audio interface here hooked up to my studio monitors so I can hear it however I want. I can hear it through studio monitors so I can actually mix as if you were in a studio and then I can just unplug and go and play it anywhere like at like I say, literally within seconds with zero effort and I can do those mixed moods while I'm listening. So that's that's the, trip, that's the other sort of secret sources that you can go out there and you can be, oh, that vocal's a little bit too loud. What does it sound like if it's bound? You don't go back to the studio and drop the vocal. You turn down that fader. You play it again. So, yeah, that, that it just makes it so much simpler and easier. And for folks starting out, it's just, yeah, it's a game changer. All right, so next question. I have uh, dabbled in GarageBand on my iPhone but I've never gotten into, um, I've never tried to mix a song out of it that way. Mm-hmm. What What are some of the things that we can expect to find as far as mix capabilities? And can we do automation and things like that? Can we control some things in any similar fashions to the ways that we're used to controlling plugins or levels or panning um, or muting in the studio? What, what are, What's possible on an iPhone like yeah. that? Yeah. A lot of things are possible, and, and and I guess when you're on an iPhone, there's different levels as well. So I, I use GarageBand probably because it limits me. Because I, as we mentioned at the start, I get overwhelmed with too many options and too much stuff to think about. So I, I deliberately use GarageBand because it is a much simpler interface. There's Cubase, there's and, and there's Aurea, and there's other uh, and uh, other sort of doors that you can use on your, your iOS device. But what GarageBand can do is actually pretty phenomenal. So you do, you have volume automation, so you can you can write a vocal and you can you can change that and you can do all of the automation that you want to do. You've got uh, built-in, com- built-in plugins, so you've got a, a visual EQ, you've got a compressor, you've got a bunch of different effects and reverbs and delays that you can add in. And then, uh, once again, the thing that actually blows people away is that you can use audio unit plugins. So you can use AU plugins on your iPad or your iPhone because there's, you you can download any other app. So a lot of different uh, a lot of different companies are now starting to make plugins just for iOS. So the AU V3 apps. So you download that app, and then GarageBand will talk to that, and you can add a separate compressor, a separate EQ. So you're actually not limited by just the stock plugins. You can now bring in whatever you want and and do a whole bunch of mixing and a whole bunch of even mastering, which I do on on my on my iPad just <laughs> using the just using Love the software. It. Like it's it, it's a hundred percent content. So yeah, that's it, it. Takes some adjusting to a touchscreen, obviously, because you're you're not uh, you know you're not mouse and keyboard. So if uh, I'm sure you know you've got Pro Tools, thing, you probably go to sleep dreaming of Pro Tools shortcuts in your head. But uh, yeah, when you're on a touchscreen, it's it's different. Uh, but once you get used to it, uh, like I said, the workflow is super quick and super flexible. Yeah, and I love that you can just go to the iPad if if you feel like it's too small and compact in your iPhone, and then yep. you probably have an easier time dealing with stuff. So that prompts me to ask you. So first of all. Audio unit plugins on an iPhone. No way, dude. That's awesome. I had no idea. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. But but it reminds me that I, I guess I did know some other stuff, and maybe it's using some of the same technologies. So, for example, when I bought my – I went from um, – I guess I had an Android first, and then I tried and I tried and I tried to do music stuff on there, and I could never really figure it out or get it to work or like – you know, this is going mm-hmm. back, you know, six years, seven years, something like that. But the yeah. – um, the multi-track uh, overdub abilities on the apps just they just never worked. They were all like yeah. there were weird latencies and timing issues and stuff. And then I switched yep. to an iPhone and all of a sudden it's like it works, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason for that is because um the hardware was limited to a single piece of hardware, or you know, it was it was very yep. strict guidelines for how the iPhones were gonna work, which probably meant that the companies that are designing software for them could design things in such a way that they knew exactly how long, you know, what the latency was going to be from the mic to record and playback. Yeah. And, and so things could really start to line up. Um, but then like the first thing I did was I got my iPhone and I spent a bunch of money on my iPhone and I spent more money on music apps. I was just like, yeah. I just couldn't get enough. <laughs> I was like 25 bucks for that. Great. I'm getting it. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I just, I just loaded up with stuff. Um, and I got all these cool apps. Uh, I was looking through what I've got now. I've got like Moog Filtatron and Animoog yep, yep. and um, other alternate stuff like iMachine 2 um, mm-hmm. and uh, DM1 Drum Machine. 
Um, but what I wanted to get to was uh, there was one called Audio Bus that I remember yeah. exploring, and that that seemed to let you connect these different apps. Is that similar to the audio unit thing, or is the audio unit thing like the the next level for what Audio Bus was trying to do? Yeah, yeah. So Audio Bus has been around for a while, and Audio Bus basically did, yeah, what what audio units and what what interapp audio, which is just another standard that's used, can do now, but it was doing it before you could even do it. So uh, yeah, it, it, it does exactly that. So there's AUM, which is another sort of app that does similar things, which is an audio unit mixer uh, that, yeah, that they do they do some pretty amazing things. So with, with Audio Bus, you can hook up apps, but you can hook up even apps that are just outputting audio that aren't compliant. So they're not actually a plugin. So if you've got an old app that's like a killer, you know, old toy piano sound that you want, you want to bring that into mm-hmm. you, you can go into there, you can grab it and you can, you know, it's just like a little plug layout. You can say, yep, yeah, plug this app into GarageBand, record that. And then it's basically like you're, like you're routing it, like you're grabbing a cable and you're actually plugging into a patch bay, except you're doing it all virtually on your phone. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's super cool. And, and to be able to just have all of those and a lot of, a lot of the apps you're mentioning there, like the, the updated versions are audio unit compatible. So yeah, once again, you can be on a track in GarageBand, you can say, use this and it'll use it just like a virtual instrument. So you can play in the other app, GarageBand's still sitting there recording it, and then you can play it back uh, directly. So it, it gives you a heap of flexibility with all the different apps and sounds that you can bring in there. Uh, yeah, you can create really cool music. So um, there was another one that I had written down called Audio Share, which I think was made it easy to yep. export things and move them around. What, what's Do you want to talk about that app? Is that something that we need to take a look at? Uh, yeah, Audio Share. I absolutely recommend. It's like a three dollar app. So if you, what what it is, it's an audio recorder. So you might think, well, you know, you got a DAW, but sometimes you just want to, you know, like a Zoom recorder, like one of the Zoom handy mm-hmm. recorders. You just want to use your phone like that. So it's just a simple thing. You can dial in. You can say, yeah, I want a forty four k sound at twenty four bit. You hit record, and it just records it. In fact, I'm using that right now to record my backup for this interview. So oh, like, great, yeah, o- Audio Share is awesome. So uh, yeah, and, and then it also does all of your conversion. So one of the tricky things in iOS is that you, and you mentioned a bit before about the Android versus the iOS thing, which is yeah. that you are kind of in iOS, you are stuck in the, the Apple world. Like there's, there's no denying that, that you, you, they have a very locked down kind of infrastructure, which means that you are married to all the things they want you to. So if you want to try and sort of convert things and change your sample rates and change, you know, convert to, to a wave or an AIF file or something like that, then audio share just does all that for you. You dump it in, you can see your waveform, you can trim it, you can convert it, you can fade it, and then, yeah, you can send it off to other apps. So I, I use that all the time as a recorder, but I also use it when I'm done with my track, I'll send it to Audio Share just so that I can trim it to get it ready for mastering and then just shoot it over, shoot the, the high-resolution WAV file over to Final Touch, which is the uh, the mastering app that I use on my iPad to, to master my song. So, nice. yeah, very handy. If you're, if you're using any audio apps on your iPhone or your iPad, grab Audio Share, and they don't pay me anything, unfortunately, but uh, no, it's, it's a great app and, and worth, worth the three bucks to, to invest. Okay, cool, man. Um, are there any limitations as far as things like like challenges where you run into file size? I know sometimes uh, I've used yeah. another app called iTalk and I might record a file and then I try and message it to somebody and say like, it's too big for the message app. And anything yeah. we need to know about like how we move things around like that and, and you know, send it off our phone to somewhere else? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and so Apple's own world, so their iCloud world, uh, is is pretty good for that. But uh, you, you're pretty limited. So I think you get five gig of space on your iCloud when you, you start out. So you can share things if you save. Say, say you've got a 600 meg uh, file, which is like your whole album of WAV files, and you want to share it to someone else, or even just you know a 50 50 megabyte master file of a WAV. Then yeah, you're going to run into those problems where you can't sort of email it or you can't send it in Messenger. So you can save it to your iCloud drive and then mm-hmm. send off a link. You can actually share it directly from there if you've got someone else that's using I, I, using an iPad or an iPhone. Uh, or, or what I like to do, so uh, the, the good thing is if you're using iOS 11 or 12, so the two more recent versions, there's a files app which actually integrates directly into your Dropbox, your Google Drive, your OneDrive. So mm-hmm. any cloud sharing platform you use, you can just shift your files over to there. It'll upload them and then you can access them from anywhere. You can share them with other people just like you would from a Mac or a PC. So I use that a lot when 
when you're, you're collaborating and when you want to send a mix to someone to, to check out, I'll just, uh, yeah, just drop it over to Dropbox and then send them the Dropbox link. They download it, they take a listen and let me know. So yeah, it, it takes a little bit, it's a little bit more fiddly, I guess, than, than what you would do on a Mac or a PC. But again, once you get used to the workflow and you work out how to do these things and, you know, if people want to know how to use these things and how to do these, that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of why I started my channel is that these things aren't super easy or intuitive to do. They take a little bit to work around, but you know, a five minute video, I can usually explain to people how to get it done. And then you got that knowledge and then you can just rinse and repeat and do that again and again. So it's yeah. doable for sure. Well, and even on a, um, you know, a studio rig like mine, I mean, I'm still going to bounce it out of Pro Tools onto a file, and then I'm going to take that and move it over to Dropbox and then copy a link and email yep. that link to somebody. So it's always that process a little bit in the end of how you're going to move, you know, send stuff over the internet. But um, yeah. but at least, you know, also what you described on the iPhone recording, that's at the end of the process. Like you've already done the mm. inspired creative stuff, um, yeah. hopefully. So so at this point, it, you know, you've got a little bit of brain power to just kind of figure, you know, go take a few steps to send something. So one more question, then we'll yeah. take a break for the for the jam session. Um, sure. But, you know, you, you talked about iOS 10 and 11, I think. And uh, so the question is, you know, do you have to have a brand new iPhone X to do this kind of stuff? Or can we use, if we have an older, if we've got our older brother's older brother uh, yeah. iPhone, you know, if that was handed down from our cousin's dog, can we use that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. It's probably the question I get asked more than almost any others, which is, yeah, I've got an old iPhone 4 or I've got an old five, iPhone 5. Can I use that to record? And the short answer is yes. And the longer, more complicated answer is it depends. So it does depend on what you're doing and what you want to get out of it. So at the absolute basic level, you can do some sort of multi-track recording on pretty much any iPhone that you want to pick up. The, the kind of the entry level these days with GarageBand is the iPhone 5S. So so that's you know, about a seven, eight year old phone at this point. So you can still get away with, with things like that. iPhone 6, 7, 8, and 10 are probably going to give you more options. And especially with something like GarageBand, they're going to give you all of the cool different alchemy synth that, uh, that Apple have in there and all of the ability to do right up to 32 tracks of audio. So uh, yeah, the, wow. like anything, the, the more that you've got, like the better better hardware you've got, the better you can actually do. Uh, but yeah, you don't you definitely don't need the best. And in fact, I'm, I've just done a video where I, I upgraded. I was I was rocking an iPhone 6S, so I was I was about six seven years behind the curve, and I've just got the iPhone uh, iPhone 10. So, uh, and I, I held out because of the uh, the lack of a headphone jack, which is a whole different topic that we we may or may not talk about. But uh, yeah, oh, we'll talk the, about it. We'll talk about it. Uh, the, but yeah, the iPhone 6, I didn't want to change from it because it was just rock solid. Like it worked perfectly. It supported all the functions I needed it to. And yeah, and again, it's it comes down to, and we'll probably talk more about this as well. But digital recording is is ones and zeros. So if you are getting a signal into your phone and it's, it's getting those ones and zeros, it doesn't actually matter what the, the piece of hardware is that's collecting those ones and zeros. If it's getting that in there and it's the same 44 kilohertz, 24 bit file, then it's going to be the same whether it's on an iPhone 6, 7, 8 or 10 as long as you're actually, it more depends on what you're actually hooking up there. So the microphone, the interface, the whatever you're actually recording, it, as long as it's capturing that sound at a good quality, then it's going to capture it digitally. So you're going to be good. Awesome. Well, Rockstars, we're going to take a break now for the jam session. A reminder that we've got links to stuff we're talking about here with Pete Johns in the show notes. If you're on your mobile device or on your computer, just click right through and you should see them, uh, including a YouTube playlist that I put together of Pete's awesome videos. So you can just scroll right to that and uh, and go check some of this stuff out if you want to. Um, Pete, is there anywhere that you want to send them to right away before we uh, before we take a break for a sec? Do you have a sort of like a you know, uh, 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 any, any cool free stuff that they should be checking out? Uh, yeah, just head on over to studiolivetoday.com. Uh, that's uh, that's my home on the internet. So studiolivetoday.com. And that's got, yeah, all of my videos, got links to my music. It's got links to my YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, you can you can take a look at what I'm working on. And yeah, there's pretty much a new video on there every day. So there's always something something different and interesting, hopefully, to, to check out. And, uh, and yeah, I'd, I'd love folks to check it out and, and leave me a comment and, and have a chat because I'm always keen to to find out what people are doing and how they're recording music. Awesome. And then when we come back, we're going to dig into the details of recording and making your record on your iPhone. So hang tight, rock stars. <laughs> we'll see you in a minute.
This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you are ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSonus Studio One. These techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you are using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to mix in your own studio and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle bundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most? which is making great music. Well, now you can rely on OWC, Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the Jam Session. My guest today is Pete Johns, joining us from Adelaide, South Australia. Pete, are you ready to jam, dude? Let's do it, Liz. Let's jam. Awesome, man. So you mentioned the new GarageBand being able to handle up to 32 tracks. And you also talked Mm -hmm. about class-compliant devices for recording. And I know you have some videos on your channel where you talk about the difference between, like, you know, a small interface and one with multiple uh, interface, or excuse me, one one with multiple inputs, and then also Mm -hmm. mixers. Um, Yep. What what does it mean to record on an iPhone if you want to use multiple mics? I mean, can are we going to hook up an Orion thirty two and and actually bring <laughs> in thirty two tracks into our iPhone at once? Is that should we even be thinking like that? Yeah, and look, uh, you you probably could. I've I've done I've done up to six channels at once. So I've I've got a a Steinberg UR forty four, which is a six channel interface. So four mic pre's and uh, and uh, two and a stereo input. Uh, so I have put that to the test and and found out if GarageBand can handle six tracks, and it can. Uh, and yeah, I've used it before to to record a live. So I've recorded say stereo acoustic guitars uh, with a gu- guitar direct in uh, straight into the sort of the DI input, and then uh, a vocal mic as well, doing four tracks at once and yeah so you can you can actually put it to the test it, it does come down to sort of the hardware that you want to to push and, and how hard you can push it but mm-hmm. that's kind of part of part of the fun sometimes is seeing what you can do what you can do with gear before you break it so right. uh yeah i've done about 32 tracks I've, I've not done that but definitely with overdubs and and uh and with you know multi-tracking then yeah you can you can get out there and uh, yeah garage band support yeah 32 tracks or 16 stereo tracks because a lot of it's virtual tracks are stereo right. uh but yeah it gives you so much scope for creating that uh the sort of music i make singer songwriter stuff i've i've never pushed <laughs> to the to the 32 track limit yet so yeah it's it's, it's very cool all right well um i guess rock stars just you know if you want to record a full band in there just try it and see how it goes yeah. you know maybe exactly uh, maybe give yourself a backup plan if you if you've got too many people's schedules tied up in that recording session <laughs> but um <laughs> you know i know for me what i love about working on the iphone is it's just this simplicity so yeah, I tend to use it or have tended to use it when I'm sort of in the songwriting stage. So, so mm-hmm. I've found that it's really handy. Um, I use an, an app called Multitrack DAW. That was one I found a while back, um, and we'll we'll discuss some of the differences between that and GarageBand here in just a moment. But I would, you know, sketch a guitar part and then um, you know play acoustic guitar in, 
and then step away from it and start composing lyrics over that. And one of the things I really love about working that way is I can use the mic on my iPhone. I would have a pair yeah. of headphones plugged in and then I could walk around. I could act literally like pace around the studio, mm -hmm. walk, you know, through different rooms and until lyric ideas hit me and then just record those in and and then you sort of tap the screen where the punch in button is when you want yep. to uh, punch in. So talk a little bit about recording vocals on GarageBand and you know what's what's your process for uh capturing your song. You do you start with the acoustic first and then add the vocals to it? How do you like to do it? Yeah, generally do. So no I, I write with a and a lot of my music is acoustic and singer songwriter stuff, so I do usually start with an acoustic guitar and start with a bit of a, a chord progression or a bit of a melody idea. Um or there could just be, you know, a, a song melody, a, a groove in my head that I want to get out there. So it's usually that I'll I'll get down the guitar, but quite often I'll and this is a, a little bit embarrassing, but I'll be walking around and I'll actually be just sort of humming the tune in. So I've actually created whole ideas, a, a lot of my songs where I'm like, oh, I want the bass line to go do 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 do, do, do. So I'm just like literally walking around with a metronome going, singing my bass line in so that when I get back to the studio, I can hook up my bass and play it. Or the That's same with great. my guitar. I'm like, uh, I need my, I want my guitar. I've got, I got the chord progression there, but I want like another, I want a lead guitar part that does this. So I'll just sort of sing it into my phone. And same sort of thing that you were saying there, you can just get it down and then you're walking around. And the same with lyric ideas, I'll have, I'll have GarageBand up, but I'll also have like my notes app in the background. So uh, the good thing about GarageBand is you can play it in the background. So you can just hit play on it. So you're listening to your track, you're listening to your instrumental, and I'll just have my notes app up there and I'll be typing in notes as I'm walking around going, ah, oh, here's an idea for this line. Mm. This needs to rhyme with this. So what are some ideas I have there? And yeah, it, it just helps with that creative process because like you say, you'll be out walking around and you'll be able to get ideas. So like when recently I was writing a song in the middle of winter here, writing a song about summer and I'm like, I got no inspiration for summer. So I walked outside in the rain and I ended up writing a song about how it was raining and how the rain was getting me down. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it was just a, a, a cool way and a cool metaphor to go, hey, I wish it was summer. Oh, write a song about how I wish it was summer. <laughs> I didn't even know you guys had winter down there. I thought it was just hot, you know, <laughs> desert weather all the time, throwing shrimp on the Barbie and all that. Oh, uh, we, we, we do we do have a winter. It's a very mild winter. It's uh, th think California winters. That's uh, that's kind of our winters, yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah, yeah. We were just out in California for winter NAM, and it was, yeah, it yeah. was raining, believe it or not. It was oh, wow. Day, yeah. Don't they freak out when summer. it rains in California? Yeah, they do, they do. <laughs> I remember eating breakfast at a place and I was sitting outside and it started to mist. And the waitresses <laughs> came running outside and they were like trying to rescue me and bring me inside. And I was just like, <laughs> what, what's all the, what's, why is everybody freaking out? It's like, this is great. Um, yeah, so, so I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that I really love to do in the studio is, you know, if the music's playing off the speakers in the control room, and I have an idea and it comes to me, I'm usually <laughs> singing the idea along in my head. I hear like a melody and it, and it hits me and it, that melody can disappear so fast. You know, it can be gone if I, if I even get distracted by something else and then trying to remember what it was. And so yeah. I'll just pull out my iPhone and record mm -hmm. and sing that melody in and then go learn it on the instrument. And um, that really can help me get some of my favorite lines on a recording. So I like that you're including that in your process you know, with the phone out and about and then come back to the studio and look for a guitar that can play that part or a bass that can play that part. Yeah, totally, and and it is because I mean I'm I'm a I'm an amateur guitarist and I'm an even more amateur bass player. So uh, yeah, when when I get back to the studio, I'm like, oh, I, I, if I can't if I can't play something, I, I can sing it, and then you know it gives me time to learn how to play it because quite yeah. often what's in my head can't translate to my hands to play it, especially if it's a complicated lead part or something like that. So being able to just sing it in and again comes back to what I said at the start, just like leave your inhibitions at the door. Don't worry about being embarrassed. Do it do it in your the comfort of your own your own uh, room or your, your audio. Case if you want to but yeah just sing it sing into your phone and and uh, get that idea down because it may not may not come back to you and you definitely may not be able to translate it to an actual instrument yet at least and the flip side to that is that sometimes what's in your hands on the guitar sucks because you bounce the <laughs> same stupid line you always sit down and play every time you pick up the guitar like yeah. I, I don't know if you ever notice that but like i'll sit down and i'll play the same little licks or voicings or whatever and i'm like I hate these. I want to do something new. <laughs> and that's the beauty of singing the line first is it forces you to to like reinvent that on the instrument and, and not get stuck. But let me ask you a couple other questions about um, sort of the tech side of this too. Latency. Mm -hmm. 
is mm-hmm. does latency become something that we need to navigate? And latency rock stars, if you know about it, you hate it. If you don't know about it, it's this <laughs> funny delay that you can hear that sounds almost like a, an effect or an echo between the mic and your headphones when you're recording. Yeah, it, and it is. So you, you suffer from the same, because you're using the same gear, the same hardware, you, you get the same sort of latency challenges. It's it's pretty good because the iPhone, especially the newer ones, are rocking some pretty decent processes. And, you know, Apple put a lot of a lot of power into those. You got a lot of RAM in there. You got a lot of uh, a lot of processing power. You don't tend to struggle anymore. So when, I, when I've recorded on, on my PC in the past, uh, yeah, latency is an issue and you do have to sort of compensate and factor for it. Uh, it's not any worse. In fact, it's probably better. So we're talking, you know, very low latency, a lot of things. And the, the beauty part is if you're recording, again, if it's, especially if it's acoustic or you're doing vocals, a lot of your interfaces have the zero latency monitoring anyway. So you can you can actually hit that. So if, you, if you're trying to record something you want to absolutely precise, you won't get your effects or your processing through. But if you want to just hear it clean and make sure you're 100% in time, you can hit that option. Or if, if you've got your effects playing back, yeah, again, it, it's still, it's not too bad. You may need to do a little bit of shifting on the grid to, to, to line up afterwards if it's if it's not quite there, um, if it's something really precise. But yeah, it, it is something to, to consider. Um, and that's why you want to buy it's decent hardware, decent gear, and, and some of the stuff that I recommend that, that has those sort of options because yeah, it, it can, like with everything, it can actually cause you some headaches and it's, it's a part of the digital, digital recording process that we all uh, have to learn to deal with over time, I guess. All right, take it. So now what about click track? Um, one of the challenges yep. that, really kind of pisses me off about recording on an iPhone is when an app, and particularly GarageBand, when I felt mm. like the app is sort of expecting me to start out by picking a tempo for a song. I'm like, I don't want to pick a damn tempo. I'm just, I'm yeah. like trying to invent something in my head right here. Don't get in my way. I just want to record the idea first. Um, yeah. How do we approach the this creative process if we have no idea what the tempo is? We just want to play the music first and then figure that out later if we need to. Uh, I'm glad you asked, Lynch. I'm not sure if you're, you're familiar with the, an app called Music Memos, which is another Apple app. It's kind of the GarageBand companion app. And what Music Memos is, is it's voice memos on steroids. So you fire up Music Memos, you hit record, and you play your idea. You sing your vocal, you play your guitar, you play your piano piece, whatever it is, anything you can record with your microphone. And it actually works out the tempo for you. And even cooler than that, it tries to work out what chords you're playing and puts those in a grid for you. So if you've got an idea, well, write a chart for me too. <laughs> it, 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 I'm not sure if it'll quite do your Nashville numbers for your uh, for, for your Lynch, but it, it goes pretty close. Like it's it's uh, it's not perfect by any stretch, but it's a super fun thing. And if you just if you're just jamming on ideas and you pick this up and you hit your record button and you just play and you're like, oh, I'm just going to do a pattern here, G C D A minor E minor. You're just playing around. Then yeah, it will pick up all of those and it will play along and go. Ah oh, yeah, let's got that. And and then you can, even cool is that you can then hit the drums and the bass and it'll add a drum and a bass track for you at that same tempo and it'll it'll match to the beat and, and work out what you're playing. So uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty phenomenal and a pretty cool way to to get your ideas in. So I use that from time to time. Or you know what, L- like you do in your door, turn the metronome off and just just jam and just record because you can always once you work out what your tempo is and once you get your idea down, then you can always scrap that and just. Sort of re-record it. So if, if you're just using it as a sketch pad, as an idea pad, then just turn the metronome off and 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 just uh, just play. Um, awesome, man. Music memos. Uh, what'd you say? It was the the memo app on steroids. So it's homicidal, yeah. angry, and has a, <laughs> an extended forehead. But um, man, it's and it's and its arms are exploding. But um, yeah, exactly. Can you take that that little idea that it sort of sketches out with drums and bass, and can you you know is there a button where you hit that and it and it just pops it over to I uh, to a Garage Band on the multi tracks for you? Is it is it that advanced or are you, uh, you're not, not yeah. yet? Yeah. It is, and it does. Uh, and the reason I was hesitant there is that it, it does send it across, but because it, it uses a flexible flexible metronome, because obviously you can speed up and slow down, mm-hmm. it, it does make it hard to then sort of translate into an actual recording, unless you're going for 100% that vibe. So if you're going for something super acoustic and super laid back that you don't necessarily want to be sitting right on the grid, then you'd be totally fine. And and uh, yeah, there, there's a guy that connected yeah. to me through through my YouTube channel that that did exactly that. He, he literally has an iPhone 7, and that is all, and he 
has like a, a guitar and a guitar amp and he's like, I'm just going to make a song. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. So he, he actually recorded it into music memos, just recording the guitar amp on his iPhone mic. He recorded his vocals and then he pushed that over to GarageBand. He did his mixing. He did his mastering in there as well. Uh, and then he's actually released that. So he's got two singles on Spotify and, and iTunes now because he just went, ah, I'm just going to do this. And uh, I love that story because it just it's a story of don't let the limitations get you down. Everyone can do this now. Uh, and it's, it's just totally possible to get a good sound. And you know, people listening to that are not going to say, wow, I bet you recorded that using your iPhone and using music memos. They're just going to go, hey, that's a cool tune. I, I, I dig that. So uh, yeah, don't, don't let that sort of stuff stop you. You can totally do what you want to do. Totally. Um, all right. So that makes me think of collaboration efforts, though. Um, I noticed mm-hmm. that GarageBand has this thing in there called like jam session or something. Mm. Um, what do you can is that something you know about? And can you hip us to what that is and how we w- might use that if we wanted to play with other people who also have GarageBand? Yeah, jam sessions a bit unique and different. It's probably probably more developed for for people sort of playing together. And uh, I, I haven't used it extensively to be to be perfectly honest Sorry. because. It's not really something that that I that I uh, have wanted to use, but what you can do in GarageBand, which is super cool, is collaborate with other people. So uh, I'm I'm a member of a, the 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 GarageBand users Facebook group. A shout out to the to the folks over there. Uh, and over there we've got like three thousand people that are all just super heavy into GarageBand. So we love creating. And just recently, a lot of folks have started collaborating using GarageBand. And the beauty part about again the the, the Apple universe, if you love it or hate it, uh, if you're on iCloud and if you're using iOS it makes it super simple to share things. And what you can actually do is you can, in real time, you can have a shared GarageBand session with multiple users. So at the moment, I'm working on a, a cover song with a couple of other guys. One guy's in Vietnam and one guy's in Nebraska, and we're just working <laughs> on this track. So I laid down the, the acoustic guitars and vocals, and I've said, okay, Ron, it's ready to go, and uh, you go ahead and, and add your vocals and guitars. And then I'm like, okay, Steve, you know, you've laid down a cool drum track. I've, I've added to it. Uh, and then, yeah, they just go into their iCloud. They hit update, and it goes, Pete's just updated some some tracks and they can see my my tracks added there, add theirs, and then it bring it all together. So yeah, there's w- super cool options to collaborate in GarageBand. And of course, the real question is, if we were to guess whether Ron or Steve was in Vietnam, on, Vietnam or Nebraska, <laughs> use your best guess, rock stars. Um, all right, so let's see, a user's Facebook group, that's super cool. Um, and then how how real time is this sort of collaborating thing? Is it more like you know you you shut yours down and it shows up on the other guy's iPhone yeah. a little while later or something like that? It is, yeah. So it's, it's it's more just uploading and downloading, but I guess it just takes. So it, it's similar to if you wanted to, you know, throw some stems onto to Dropbox. So if you if you sent that over to someone, they bring them into their DAW, they add to it, they they zip it up, they send it back to you. It just kind of simplifies and, and automates a lot of that process. So similar to the to what we we're talking about before with being able to sort of just send things and in, in real time and, and be able to play your tracks wherever you go. It kind of makes it easier to collaborate too because once once your tracks are uploaded to iCloud, then if you've shared it with someone else they can download those tracks from their iCloud. So real-time collaboration, hey, it might, might be there in the future, but uh, I know with my internet speeds, uh, yeah, real-time audio collaboration is way out of the question right now, but uh, you never know what's around the corner. All right, dig it. Um, what are some of the most common questions that you get asked about mobile recording? What are some things that people are just always asking about? Yeah, so it, it really comes down to, to, to be honest, a lot of people are like, I don't believe you or I don't believe it can be done or how can you actually get good quality? Because I think a lot of people are a lot of people are under the impression that it's it's some something of like a, a lesser. So it's like a, a toy a toy studio or a toy door for people to use. And it's just for sort of kids to mess around with and record. So I think the question I get from most people is, is can I legitimately actually do this? Can I, can I actually record my tracks? Will I get a good sound? How can I get a good sound? Uh, and a lot of the other questions are what you would get as well and what anyone sort of talking to folks that are starting out or, or wanted to make their best records, which is, yeah, especially for the home studio folks, it's how do I reduce the background noise? How do I get a quality mm-hmm. recording? How do I, how do I manage gain staging? You know, how do I, uh, yeah, what, what microphone do I buy? What interface do I buy? So uh, a lot of stuff around that. I guess the, the the mobile specific stuff is a lot around hardware. So the question you asked before, which is which iPhone or iPad should I get? So I, 
actually did a couple of videos on those and and I have a, a couple of um, a couple of checklists over if you go to studiolivetoday.com slash iPad or studiolivetoday.com slash iPhone, I've actually got a checklist there that shows you all of the different iPhones and iPads and it tells you which ones are compatible, which ones can run GarageBand, which ones can run the Alchemy synth, which ones can give you the full sort of 32 track experience. So that was something I, I made because a lot of folks were asking that question. They were saying, hey, I want to record, but what do I need? And, and the other thing I did at the same time was, you know, what gear can I use? Like what, what's the best mobile recording gear to use? Like how do I know it's class compliant? How do I know what I can use? So I did the same thing with that. And uh, again, if you go to studiolivetoday.com right. slash gear, uh, you can actually check out the gear guide. So that's my, what I use. So I'm like, these are the mics that I use that work well. This is the interface I use. This is a MIDI controller. And all of these I have personally tested and they work with with iOS. So that's yeah, if, you, if you're looking to get into it, you can you can head over to, to, to those uh, those links and uh, yeah, you'll be able to check out uh, check out and find out. Those are always the questions that we ask. All we ever care about is what our problem is. So we just want to yeah. go like, hey man, with my phone, can I do this with with it? You mm-hmm. know. Um, all right. So let's see. Uh, now, how about how much money to get started with a mobile recording studio? You got any answers for that? Uh, yeah, so and that is that is definitely a question, uh, which is you know, what what is it going to cost to to get me set up, and and how do I actually do that? So it's it's again, it, it's basically like you'd set up a, a a home studio as well. And and the beauty part is that if you have your if you have your phone or if you have your your iPad, uh, you you've already got. Your, your device. So you don't need a computer, you don't need a Mac, your PC, you don't need to and worry about software. that. You don't need to do and, a and subscription your software, exactly. Or Spot on. So you don't need to buy a door if you use a garage band, 100% free. You've already probably got an iPhone because you need one to yeah, survive in life <laughs> and uh, to get by these days, you need a smartphone. So you're really just looking at the gear. And uh, yeah, I, I, what I say to folks is that you can get away with, you can buy a $50 USB microphone and uh, the, the cable, which is $40, yeah, the Apple USB cable. And for less than 100 bucks, you can start making decent recordings. If you want to sort of take it up to the next level, you can buy an audio interface. So again, $100 Steinberg UR12 or a, or a Focusrite Scarlett uh, Solo, another $100 USB interface, and then you know, microphones, it's, it's just like you would in any other studio. So you can buy a you know, $60, $70 condenser, you get a good sound. You plug in a $200 condenser, you get a slightly better sound. So uh, I, I like to say that I, I still record on the gear that I use and recommend and that anyone can use. So my, my entire studio set up with my interface and the microphones I use, the headphones I use is less than $400. So it, it's totally affordable to get into this and to get into it at a decent quality and to actually be able to record whole songs, whole EPs, whole albums using just your iPhone or your iPad with a very limited amount of gear. Um, so I'm also going to point out, Rockstars, a reminder that your phone that you're recording onto GarageBand with, it doesn't have to be a phone. Like you could take your old, mm. like if you've got the new iPhone X, but you still have an old iPhone 5 laying around, you know, yeah. uh, that you can still run it as a studio. Um, mm-hmm. And the nice part is you won't get, you know, you won't get interrupted with messages and phone calls, you know. Uh, and that's a really good point and a good aside is that, uh, yeah, again, a little bit of a tip there, but uh, yeah, you do need to be careful with that. You don't want to be halfway through an epic guitar solo and have your, your mum call you to to, uh, to <laughs> chat about something. So uh, make sure you're in do not disturb and in airplane mode if, you, if you're really jamming out. Is that my mother because... on the phone? Was that the police? Synchronicity. <laughs> <laughs> Great, man. Um, um, all right, uh, now, so uh, more gear questions. Uh, yeah. Where do you set up your iPhone and your iPad while you're recording? Are th- is there any mm-hmm. like uh, additional gear that we haven't thought of? Like, do you have a little, a little clip that puts it on your mic stand or any clever stuff like that that we want to be aware of? Yeah, so I, I use a few different things. Uh, and again, if you go and if, I've got a whole bunch of gear, so there's a, a heap of gear videos over on the, on my channel uh, where I sort of talk about a lot of this stuff. So I have a little uh, a little stand, like so, just a little mini tripod that I uh, have for my iPhone that clips in there. Uh, my iPad just has a, a nice little folding case, one of the Apple folding cases, so I can sort of sit upright. So I'm looking at the screen and it's nice and secure mm-hmm. on on my desk. So just in front of my uh, front of my monitors of my computer, so I'm I'm ready to go there. Um, so yeah, and then. In terms of the rest of the gear, it's really just like that. The the most important thing, and I'll, I'll probably talk about this again more later, is, is just to be able to connect it to all of your devices. So I, I'd have that the single USB to Lightning connector, uh, which also powers. So it's got a little Lightning plug in there, so you can power up because power is probably one of the biggest considerations that you need mm-hmm. to keep in mind is to power up all your gear. So I have a couple of those power bank batteries just always charging and always ready to go, uh, and a, a USB hub as well. So a powered USB hub. So 
in terms of my studio setup, how I have it, I'll have my USB hub, I'll have my iPhone sort of in its little clip that's on my little mini tripod, and my iPhone sort of stood up in front of me on its stand, and then the USB to lightning connector that goes into all of my gear via the hub so I can have my mini keyboard, my interface, uh, and everything else always hooked up and, and ready to rock. So cool, man. I love it. Um, and I love this this image of like walking into the studio, plugging in your phone, yeah. how it's connected to the studio, unplug it, leave the studio, go for a walk, yeah. you know, just plug your headphones straight into the phone and, and yep. see how things sound that way. Um, what did I want to ask you about next? So I, I know you record acoustic guitar. Uh, what if we're more into electric guitar? What, what advice mm-hmm. do you have for us about that process if we want to rock out a little more with our iPhone? Yeah, well, the, the the good news is is for for electric guitar, it's it's pretty awesome. And uh, like the if you've got a if you've got an amp, like so if you've got a really cool amp and you want to mic it up, you got to get your SM57. You got your technique you use. You can use exactly that technique on your your iPhone as well. So there's no problems if you've already got your, your flow that you want to use. But a lot of the interfaces these days, like the, the USB interfaces, will have the ability to just plug your guitar straight in uh, at the instrument level signal. So you can just plug your guitar in. Uh, and the beauty part about GarageBand, it's got a heap of amp simulators or Already built in, so you can just dial up your your Marshall type amp or your Vox type amp and get the tone that you want, and just be jamming out to that. So uh, that, that's how I record most of my guitars now. And the 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 next sort of level of that is that you can also then go and grab your audio unit plugins. So you can grab you know, the Amplitude that a lot of folks might be familiar with, and there's a whole heap of other really cool apps that you can use via audio unit. So you can basically say, yeah, I want to use this amp, plug it in, use your audio unit plugin, plug in your guitar, and you're rocking out. And you can do that in like two two seconds. So you just plug in your guitar, you go select, I want to sound like a Marshall stack, I want to put it through a, a distortion pedal, and play, and then you're jamming. Okay, so now one of the challenges I remember having when I was trying to figure out what was cool out there is just the the simple mundane task of searching on the App Store to find the right kind of apps. Mm. Any tips there as far as, um, you know, if we want to find all these audio unit plugins, how do we find them on there? What do we search for? It is a really hard thing. If you search AUV3 is is what will be tagged in all of these apps. So if you're, if you're searching for music apps and you want to work out, if it's, is it going to be a plugin and are you going to be able to use it with your other software? So whether it's GarageBand or Cubasis or Aurea, I know we've focused a lot on GarageBand because it's what I use, but there's heaps of other, there's multi-track door, there's a heaps of other uh, doors that you can get on, on iPad and iPhone. But yeah, anything that's audio unit, so search audio unit or AUV3. Uh, and again, like there's a heap of different forums. So there's a great Facebook group, which is the AUV3 plugins Facebook group, which uh, basically just maintains a list of all of the plugins that are available online. Um, so you can, yeah, you can go and check out what's available. Uh, and, and of course, you can go onto YouTube. So if you if you search, uh, yeah, iOS AU plugins, uh, there's myself and there's a heap of other great uh, YouTube creators that are very focused on testing, trialing, reviewing all of the different plugins. So you can you can go nuts and, and, and like plugins on your on Oh, and your you desktop. will go nuts. You will go nuts. You will. Oh, like like. <laughs> Just done. You'll uh, get get your credit card ready because you will go nuts. Uh, and just just like, but I guess the uh, the the warning there is to uh, yeah to like like all plugins, you can go nuts with it. You know what? If you want to have some fun, just go out and do it. Go go your hardest. But uh, yeah, for for those starting out a mistake I've seen folks make is that they get really excited and they buy all of the different things and then they don't really ever use them or don't have time to use them or to learn them. So my approach is to find a problem that you want to solve. So it's like, oh, I, my, my vocals, I don't know how to DS them. All right, I'll get a DS a plugin or the, the EQ that I have in GarageBand doesn't let me do really fine cues. So I can't actually notch out this particular part and, and that I want to filter out. Well, then you can download an EQ plugin that lets you do that. So cool. um, that's the way I approach it. Again, different people will do different things but i guess yeah make sure you keep keep creating music uh because it can get very distracting to just play with cool apps uh, all the time so um you know when you talk about using the plugins on on a track i imagine that as you start to get close to 32 tracks or whatever and you got more plugins going you start to you know you may begin to tax your iphone's processing power is there an ability to kind of commit a track or anything like that once you got a sound going so that you can just now just have a piece of audio and and get back to business. 
Yeah, definitely. So, so again, very similar. If, if anyone's experienced using any other sort of door, you can you can bounce your tracks down. You can you can what, what's called merging in GarageBand. So you merge your tracks. So you can merge either a single track onto itself, which basically takes takes it, its effects, its plugins. If it's a virtual track, it will just render it out. So then you can actually have just a, a static audio track that has all of that baked in. So you can do that, and you can even do it with multiple tracks. So that's the the beauty part is if you are getting up to thirty two tracks, and and folks have asked this question. You you, you asked before. You know, what, what are some of the questions? This is actually what I get quite a lot. They're like, okay, I've hit 32 tracks. What do I do now? Yeah. So it's a matter of going, okay, I've got, you know, I've got six v- background vocal tracks. Like, can I just get the, get everything set, pan it down and then bounce it down to one stereo track. And that's my backing vocal track now. And, and I'm, I'm going to commit to that. So yeah, they're the sort of things that you can do and you, you have absolute control and, and flexibility to do that. And it's actually a good thing that I've, I've learned over time is that sometimes committing to stuff actually helps out. Otherwise you, you, you're overwhelmed with every option then yeah. you're probably going to struggle to choose one. <laughs> but that's so cool, man. I love that you can just bounce that stuff. I'm getting really excited to go back and check it again now. <laughs> um, before I get more questions about that, but before we go there, I still want to ask you, one of the frustrations, biggest frustrations for me with GarageBand was that I would start out and I'd have an idea and I'd press record mm-hmm. and I'd go and m- maybe I'm listening with a click and I'm like, that's fine. I'll just pick that tempo, whatever. And I'm recording. And then all of a sudden it just stops after like yep. four bars or eight bars. And I was like, what the fuck? So tell us, what's the story with that? How do we not have it cut us off in the middle of our brilliant idea? Yeah, so that it's, it's one simple setting. So there is a, a setting in your garage band, which is to set your track length to automatic. So, and this was this was actually my biggest problem. And, and I, I really need to make a video that is just this. It's like, are you only getting eight tracks in your garage band? Do this because I, I get this weekly, if not daily question, because not, not eight when tracks, you go, so by eight bars, right? That's what eight bars. Sorry. Yeah. 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 yeah eight bars. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so why am I only getting eight bars? And it's because that's what it defaults to. And, it, and a lot of folks will pick up garage. And I did this for the longest time, but the first year that I was using garage, I'm like, Oh, this is cool to make an eight bar loop. Like, right. I guess this is, right. this is what it does. Uh, One day yeah, if like, I become just, a DJ. Right, exactly. And, and again, it's, it's so that you can pick up and go and that people don't get overwhelmed with everything. But yeah, if, if you do want to actually expand it out, if you go into your settings there and you just change that from eight bars to automatic, then you can just hit record and it will it will stay with you as long as you want. And then when you finish your first part, you can do it again. Or you can just go in there and, and grab that little slider and slide it all the way up to 200 bars or 300 bars. And then you, yes. you can jam out for as long as you want. So uh, yeah, it's... It, it, that is one of the things that I wish they would actually change because w- when you get it by default, it's it's set to eight bars. I wish they would change that to automatic because a lot of folks get confused and they're like, oh, I, this is great. Like if I want to make a loop, but no, nah, it, it, it is simple to do and, and you can even then define all your sections. So like like most doors, you can you can jump in there and you can say, okay, here's my intro, here's eight bars and here's 16 bars for my verse, here's another 16 bars for my chorus and you can actually map it out so that you've got better control. But yeah, yeah go in there, set it to auto and you'll be good to go. Well, I think it's that difference between the songwriting mentality that comes from I'm dragging a loop from the loop browser mm-hmm. or I'm using, you know, programming a beat versus I have an acoustic guitar in my hand and I'm going to sing, yeah. you know, it's a different it's a different approach to what's needed in a DAW. Um, but where do we find the uh, you know, make uh, what would you call it you said like make it make it endless or unlimited bars? Yeah. Yep. So if you if you if you're in a garage band on, on your iPhone or your iPad, you you tap in. There's a little a uh, little plus button that's uh, up in the top right corner. This is the other problem. It's really really hard to find. So if you if you if you're listening in and you've got your iPhone in your hand, uh, jump out, go into Garage Band and tap on that little plus button, and then you'll actually be able to go into your sections and you'll be able to change the number of bars, or you'll be able to tap it over to automatic, and then you'll be able to to record uh, as long as you want to. But yeah, it's, it's not even in the settings. It's not even somewhere that's really intuitive, and it's funny because this is something that uh, it was the frustration I had. It's why I created the channel. It's that GarageBand is really simple to do some things, but then it seems like it, it deliberately hides some of the settings just to make it super tricky. Or maybe they did it deliberately so Pete could make a YouTube channel and, and help people <laughs> uh, help people find out how to do it. But yeah, it's amazing that for something that's so simple and so user-friendly, you know, my, my kids can pick it up. Like a, a, a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, yeah. and they pick it up and they're making beats and they're making loops. But again, it's, it's almost like sometimes it's designed it's for them. Yeah, exactly. It's those guys that are like, no, man, I just want to jam. Uh, how do I do that? So yeah, it's it, it's possible, but again, it's a little bit of a learning curve, a, a little bit of a steeper learning curve than you'd probably imagine with a with an app like that. All right. So next question pertaining to jamming, the jam, the jamness. Mm-hmm. Um, in Logic, for example, there's something called drummer track 
where you sort of, yeah. you lay out this, and it sounds like there's a drummer playing along with you and you just start playing to that. Is there something similar to that in GarageBand? There absolutely is. They, they, they have actually stolen and shifted the logic. So the, the way the sort of GarageBand world works is that there's logic, uh, which is sort of the, the granddaddy, the, the big sort of pro door. GarageBand on the Mac is like a stripped down version of logic that just has most but not all of the features. And then GarageBand iOS is a little bit of a combination of the two. So mm-hmm. we actually get quite a lot of the the features that have come down and a lot of the updates in GarageBand have been to add that. So in, in GarageBand version about two years ago, they added in the drummer, so the uh, the virtual drummer feature. So you can absolutely do that. And that that actually really helps because I actually, you, you talked about metronomes before and uh, I don't know if you like rocking out to a, a like a click track, uh, but sometimes. I certainly don't. <laughs> so yeah, replacing your click track with just an auto drummer. So you just find a groove that you like that's going to help your song, and then you hit your auto drummer, and then he's playing your click track, and then you're good to go. So uh, yeah, the auto drummer is cool, and and GarageBand has that feature across everything else. So there's auto bass, there's auto guitar. Like you can basically program program in your chord pattern, and this is why I love GarageBand. You can you can do it all yourself. So you can just have 32 tracks of of complete audio that you record yourself through a microphone just like you would in a, in any other door, or you can do it 100% virtual. So you can grab your virtual strings, your bass, your guitar, your drums, and someone with like very limited musical knowledge can be creating a song. And, you know, some people, some of the rock stars might say, hey, is, is that really creating if you're just grabbing a bunch of loops and presets and just punching it in there? But if it's getting you started and if it's helping you create, or maybe you're, you're, you're a really great guitarist, but you're a terrible bass player, or you've never picked up a pair of drumsticks, or you have no friends that can record your drums, I, I, I'm happy to say, I use the virtual drummer in a lot of my tracks because it, it sounds realistic. These are, are actually sampled drum sounds mm-hmm. and it, it's putting drum patterns in there that if I sat down and tried to program MIDI drums, it's going to take me four hours to program the whole track that it might take me two or three minutes to just decide what uh, sort of settings I want in my virtual drummer and then I can just tweak it as I go along. So yeah, definitely some very cool options there, especially for the songwriting process, but even down to the actual mixing and mastering, you can you can legitimately use a lot of these features and, and they sound great. They sound good in, in your tracks. Awesome, man. Um, all right, so next question. I got lots of them, dude. This <laughs> one is, um, okay, so we just, we got this click on, we just played our acoustic guitar. We're like, ah, oh, mm-hmm. totally screwed up at the second chorus going to the bridge. We just want to mm-hmm. back up and drop into record and keep going. What's the yep. process for doing that? And you know, you've, you've you only have two hands. One of them's on the neck, and one of them's on the pick of your guitar. So yep. how are you going to record yourself? Yeah, that's the beauty part about GarageBand as well. Like like most doors, uh, it's it's non-destructive. So all of your editing and all your recordings are completely non-destructive. So remember, if if, if you want to flash back to to my uh, four track days, like punching in on a four track was was fun, and I say fun in sort of air quotes because it wasn't super fun, try to actually get that lined up and you're like, oh man, i got to punch in right at that spot and get my guitar part in. Um, but yeah, the beauty part of digital is that it, it doesn't matter. So all I do on GarageBand is I go two or three bars back, I hit record, I start playing along with the track, and then when it gets to the point where I need to punch in, I'm already playing, and then I could do my editing after the fact. So if there's a, a spot where I'm like, oh no, I screwed that up, I need to go back, I'll just go back a few bars, set my playhead there, hit record on that same track. It will overwrite the old track, but then all I need to do is grab it, like just touch it on the touch screen, drag it across, grab my first take that first piece of audio drag that up find the point in between where it's going to sound the best and not get any clicks and pops and then you're good to go you got your two pieces of audio they're lined up you're golden okay so uh, so you don't use sort of an auto punch feature where you hear the guitar you play it up right up to the downbeat of the chorus and then it punches in for you do you know if that exists on on GarageBand? it does yeah so that there is multi there's multi-take recording and there's the ability to to sort of use multi-takes on on the same track that you can do uh where you can sort of select between takes uh there's no sort of i guess punch in as in to say yeah I, here's my punch in point and then you, you hear it back but uh what i do to get around that if i want to hear that guitar part and then sort of go on is i'll just simply duplicate that track and then mm. get all the same settings hit record on that second track and then i'm hearing the first track and as soon as the first track cuts out i'm playing on the new one and then i can just drag and drop and pop that back onto the first track so even if you don't want it because yeah like you say if you do it on that first track it cuts out like at that point where it starts recording you might want to hear that part so that you're right in the groove and you can just continue on with that same guitar part so just grab a second track duplicate it out record on that one and then yeah you can you can do the editing afterwards okay dig it now when you say drag and drop is it literally like you can sort of with your finger drag the bit of audio from one track and just drop it onto the other track 
Totally, yeah. So you can you can literally drag and drop just like you do, uh, yeah, in, in anything else on on iOS. So you can you can got handles at each end of your audio. So just like you click with a mouse and you'd sort of trim, you can do the same sort of trim functions. Uh, you can copy, you can cut and paste, you can do all your standard editing. But then, yeah, when you want to move a piece of audio, do that flying around thing that we all love to do in our doors. You can actually fly it around with your finger, which is uh, is pretty fun uh, on a smaller screen. Like it is definitely one of the challenges because if you've got a complex track and you're trying to get that that tiny little guitar part, and you're trying to make sure that you're, you're perfectly lined up so that you're, you're right in the, in the right spot. It can be a little tricky. You can use the Apple Pencil. You can use a stylus on there if you want to. If you've got fat fingers like mm-hmm. mine and you tend to move things around, just grab a little stylus and then you can just, yeah, drag and drop that. Or, or like we said before, uh, shoot it over to your iPad. That, again, that's the beauty part. You just go airdrop to iPad. Your whole track gets sent via, via uh, airdrop by Bluetooth in like about a minute. And then you're on your bigger screen. You can do your editing and your mixing there, which is where I do a lot of my uh, editing and mixing process. Oh, that's cool. Um, and then, uh, you know, I don't actually have an iPad. So if I was like, hmm, what, what iPads out there? Or which ones should I get? What are some basic, um, you know, uh, how do you basically describe what the different iPad sizes are? Or are there like, do I need to spend a ton of money on an iPad? Or are there less expensive ones? Yeah, yeah, you you really don't because anything that's like, so the iPad and I won't get into the whole naming convention of Apple because it's crazy, but uh, anything from the iPad Air two, which is actually what I still use. So an iPad Air two is about a seven or eight year old iPad. You can pick them up for a couple of hundred bucks uh, second hand, cool. uh, and they they do a really good job. And you know, they, then it comes down to how much you know memory and how much uh, how much storage space you have on them. But it yeah, it, that, that's all I I use most of the time is a sixty four gig iPad Air two, and and that does everything. Thing that I need it to do and, and, and doesn't have a problem. Uh, and most of your iPads, so your standard iPads are around that 10 inch sort of size, 9.7 inch up to about 11 inches. And then you got your big iPad Pro. So uh, a lot of the big boys that are, uh, are recording, a lot of big boys, big girls, I should say, a lot of the, the producers and people that are doing a mm-hmm. lot of stuff, especially electronic music uh, using iOS, have got the big 13, 12.9, 13 inch uh, iPad Pros, which are the ones that I just walk into the Apple store and drool over and then look at the $2,000 <laughs> price tag and walk out again but uh yeah they, they they have the big massive screen and then you can it's like you got a whole keyboard on there you got like 40 keys or something that you can play on, on your on your keyboard there so uh but yeah again like if you go to studiolifetoday.com slash ipad uh i've got my sort of ipad buyer's guide there so that that tells you what ipads are kind of your minimum specs and it gives you a few tips and hints around the sort of things to look for when you are looking for it and i've done a, a video as well that's all about how to choose that that ipad and the same with the iphone because it can be, like I said, the Apple naming conventions are not good, especially with iPad. There's the iPad 2017, there's the 2018, there's the Pro Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3. Yeah. So yeah, wh- which one do you go for? It can be really hard. And, and if you're searching around, especially to buy one used, you might want to go, oh, is this going to do it? And you don't want to yeah, get exactly. home and be dis- disappointed that it's not exactly. going to run it. So yeah. That's the frustration is you go look at prices and you're like, oh, 200 bucks, 300 bucks. Great. Mm. I can do it. And then you're like, wait a minute, this is is this this is an old one? Is this one? Will this one do what yep. I need and stuff? Um, so, Rockstars, I want to remind you also that uh, your your when your iPhone and your iPad don't have enough space on it, you know they're they're running out of space or, you're, or they're not big enough. It's not your iPad's fault. It's because you're not <laughs> emptying out your stuff and cleaning house and dumping those photos and old recordings and videos off and. Sadly, even those podcast episodes you need to remove <laughs> from your your iPhone every once in a while. So, I mean, you can do a lot with 16 gigs, I think, if you just are, yeah. you know, if you don't l- fill it up with junk. Although I, mm-hmm. I would imagine 16 is probably, you probably are going to run it because apps are a little bigger now too, right? They are, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I recommend 32 or 64 if you can. It comes down to budget. But like you say, for, for 16 gig, if you're, if you're running GarageBand, which is about a one gig app, and then you've got a few plugins. So if, if it's a dedicated studio iPad mm-hmm. that you're using, uh, then you'll be golden. Because again, if you if you use things, so if you work, unless you're working on 20 projects at once, you're usually only working on maybe four or five projects. So just be be vigilant about your backing up. Make sure you're sending your, your old archive projects over to a Dropbox or to a Google Drive or something and, and only keep what you you need on your actual device right. because it can run out and and the other the other hack and, and I don't know if you've come into this with your iPhone but when you delete stuff it doesn't delete so when you delete it it goes into a place called recently deleted where you have to go and delete it from so if you ah. have a bunch of photos or videos and you delete them then you also then need to scroll down on your photos app and go to recently deleted and say get rid of them forever delete forever and then they'll actually go off your device and the same with your your project files and your audio files if you're in the file 
files app of your iPhone or your iPad. If you delete something from there, it just goes into your recently deleted. So scroll down again, hit recently deleted, delete all, and then you'll be you'll be good to go. You'll be able to actually uh, use that space. Otherwise, it'll look like you're like, hey, I just deleted like 14 different giant videos. Why don't I have space? It's because they're sitting there and you recently deleted because Apple doesn't trust you. It thinks yeah. that you might want them back. <laughs> right, exactly. And it's probably right. You probably Most people probably do want them back. Later. But so um, you know, the other bit uh, that I want to say about that is that um, you're lucky if you've only got 14 videos you're trying to delete. The real challenge that I run into is I'm like, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to delete 2,000 photos and yeah. off my phone because I tend to get big ones. And then I go look on there. I'm like, well, how do you just select them all and delete? Uh, you can't. You can select, I think, um, them in chunks, like they're like moments or something. Uh, but yeah. I w- I, without going too deep into that, I'll just say – uh, rock stars, just do some Googling because you'll find somebody who explains how you go delete big amounts yep. of photos all at once. And I recently got an app, and I, I forgot what it's called because my phone's off now while we do this interview. But there was an app that I got that would kind of smart select all my photos and and throw them all away for me all at once. So that was pretty hip. Mm-hmm. So there are ways to do Very it. Cool. Definitely. Um, Very cool. Definitely. All right. So uh, let's see. Vocal production. Mm-hmm. Can we do full vocal production, comping and tuning and getting vocals really sounding great on a mix? Uh, even things like clip gain, do things like that exist in a, in a iOS? They do, yeah. So this is what blows me away is that there's there's kind of ways to do everything. Uh, and so we can actually do vocals. So for vocals, for my vocal sort of production, my workflow that I have is that I'll, I'll record my vocals in pretty clean. Like I'll usually have a bit of reverb or a bit of delay when I'm recording just to, to make my vocal performance a, a bit better. And then I'll go in and I'll start sort of working and editing the vocal down. So yeah, for, for me, the biggest thing is volume. So volume automation. Um, and the, the only challenge, I guess, with volume automation on uh, GarageBand and on a lot the other iOS apps is that once you sort of add it, then you lose, you can't use your volume fader anymore. So you, you, you then you're committed to using automation completely. So what right. I tend to do is, is I actually do a lot of clip gain to start with. Um, so you can actually go into, I'll, I'll slice up my, my vocals. So I'll slice it into the verses, the chorus, the bridge, the, the outro, whatever it needs to be. Uh, and then I'll go through and anywhere where I'm like peaking too high or I need to bring it up, I'll, I'll actually clip gain that to get it to a sort of a static mix to start with um, before I actually do the automation. So I kind of do two layers of automation, I guess. I do mm. clip gaining first just to, to really pull out anything that's standing out to me and then get it sort of a nice static mix. And then the automation is more to add the flavor. So if I want a little bit more volume in a chorus just to really punch through, then I can sort of automate it up then. Or if I need it to be a quiet section in a bridge, I can automate down. So yeah, using the, the, the clip gain is really cool. You just basically tap on any of your audio items, go to your settings, and then you've got a gain slider right there. So you can drop the gain, you can increase the gain there. And then with your automation, you actually tap over on your microphone icon and there's an automation button there and then it'll bring you an automation lane and then you just basically write in your automation just like you would uh, so you can't sort of write there's no writing your volume or anything but it would be kind of tricky to write on your screen while you're playing back on an iphone but you can add in your, your automation points so you can basically just tap in there and then drag up and down to make oh, your volume okay. automation go up and down uh, as you're listening and, and as you're, you're sort of tracking through so you're not you're not grabbing a fader and moving the fader while it's playing back. You're just yeah. you go in and put it put in the little uh, break points on the automation yep. line. Okay, cool. That's well, it. Yeah. a lot of times we do that anyway, and at least when you do mm. that, you're like, at least I know where it's turning up and turning yeah. down. You know. <laughs> yeah, otherwise if you, you get those sort of weird waves that you're just like there's 4,000 automation points and it's impossible to edit. So yeah, I actually I actually do that. Even when I'm using a desktop door, I use the, the little point and click. So yeah, it's it's, it's really handy and it's a, a lot of great options there. So the vocals I find, uh, and again, you, you've got all the built-in effects, you've got your reverbs and your delays. And then if, if I want something special, I can yeah grab an audio unit plug-in and throw that on the vocal track. I guess the limitation, it might be a future question, is that we don't have any buses uh, on, on GarageBand specifically. There mm. are other doors that do so if you if you do a lot of sending and receivings to like the same reverbs or the same delays that you want to use we don't have that option specifically available so you're, you're basically you're adding plugins directly to each track so that can make a little bit more effort if you've got a big a big production and you want to say oh, i just want to push a little bit of this all these tracks to this one reverb well yeah you've got to go and dial it in separately on each individual track so that's i guess one of the limitations that you have there uh but yeah uh, apart from that in terms of what you can do with your production it it's yeah 
it's only at the limits of, of what you want to add and, and, and the effort that you want to go to. Well, I guess if you wanted to do any kind of parallel processing, you'd just simply duplicate the track with the audio on it mm-hmm. and treat that one differently, right? Definitely. And I, and I use that all the time. So uh, the other thing, I guess, is the automation is only volume. So we don't have automation on effects. So we don't have automation on panning and that sort of thing. So there are ways to do that, but you basically just need to get creative with your second and your third tracks. So if you want panning automation, just create two tracks, pan them left and right, and then just ride the volume between them. And you can get a panning automation type effect. Uh, and the same thing with your effects. So uh, I recently recorded a punk song just for a bit of fun, because uh, <laughs> sometimes it's cool to, to step out of your normal zone. Uh, and you know, you got that punk punk effect where you get that delay at the end of the, at the end of a word so I wanted that delay but I just wanted it on one word so all I had to do there was grab my original track snip the audio take that word down to a second track add the the reverb or the delay on, on that track and then it would just smoothly go straight through the rest of the, the verse goes there and then that last word just hits that track that is just sort of soaking in delay and then you get that cool effect but just on that last bit so yeah, yeah there's, cool. there's definitely ways ways to do it, it just takes a little bit of a uh, little bit of moving around Cool, cool. All right, now what about things like vocal tuning? What if we're not such a great singer as we kind of wish we were? What, or do we have options to kind of straighten out the, the note choice in our vocals? We, we do. It's it, it's a little bit limited. So GarageBand in particular is a little bit limited. The, again, you can delve into the world of the the third party apps and the the audio unit plugins to do just like you do with you know the the melodines and the the auto tunes of the world. Uh, but the the built in one in GarageBand is actually pretty good. Um, it's it's not super controlled, so you can't kind of go in and do your, sort of your manual edits and say okay that one's actually an E and that note's actually an F. Uh, but you can actually just turn on the auto tune and dial it in, and you basically just got a a one knob auto tune. So yeah, yeah, you can you can t you can t paint it. You can just put it up yeah, to the top. Jack and, it up, and, man. Jack it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Um, or but if you put it quite subtle. So if I've got a vocal, and, and again, if you use that multi track method, what I'll tend to do is because you can either just turn it on or off. I'll kind of have a, a an untuned and a tuned vocal track, if that makes sense. So one vocal track will be my vocal that I don't want it to apply anything to. But then if I've got a few sections where I'm a little bit off on some notes, I'll just cut those out, put those on a second track, and then add the enhanced tuning plug-in in GarageBand to those, just a little tiny bit, just so that it's just going to grab those that are just a little bit sharp or a little bit flat and just to sort of level those out. So if, you, if you're using that, you're like, oh, I don't want to put this on my whole track because my vocal's pretty good, but there's this one part that's poking out, then you can cut that bit, put it on your second track and, and tune that one. Clever. And if you're good about bouncing your tracks or merging them, as you said, then yeah. you're still with 32 tracks at mix, you'll still have hopefully enough room to sort of you know, dedicate three tracks or something like that to yep. vo- the vocal so you can do these Definitely. tricks. Um, now, what for about sure. mu- music style? I mean, who is GarageBand for? Is, it, is this only for people who do a certain style of music or do you feel like there's some flexibility there? Yeah, the, the, there's definitely flexibility. And I guess GarageBand and, and uh, iOS music production in general gets sort of tagged with uh, electronic, EDM, like a, a lot of beat-oriented, and you said before, like loop-oriented, beat-oriented music. And l- a lot of the stuff is probably was originally designed for that. So there's a heap of different like synth sounds. There's loops that you can bring in, like uh, the Apple Loops has a whole pile of different loops that you can use. And so for electronic music creation, it is really good, but I, I tend to find that there's a lot more people getting into it with all sorts of styles. So I mentioned the, the GarageBand users Facebook group. We got 3,000 people there. We got we got reggae artists there. We got metal heads. We got punks. We got uh, singer-songwriters like myself. Uh, every different style of music you can imagine. And they're all making it on GarageBand because at the end of the day, you, you can use it how you like it. It's actually it's kind of fun to, to try. That's why I, I do different types of songs. I did Lucky, which is more of a, a loop and a beat-based song. And I recently did my, my punk song, which is a lot more sort of the heavy distorted guitars because just doing those different things can help you learn and help you you do different things and you might find a a technique that you use creating something different that actually works really well so sometimes I will use some of the synth effects as as pads in my singer-songwriter song so uh, you know don't don't be afraid to go I'm a singer-songwriter therefore everything must be 100% acoustic uh, unless that's the vibe you're going for sometimes you can actually bring in those elements so uh, yeah I I guess I like to think it's for everyone and the, the more it evolves and the more that it updates, I think that, yeah, it really works with every different genre of music. That's great, man. All right. Now you did mention also, uh, at one point you were talking about the giant iPad and, and like, you know, mm-hmm. full size joking about a full size keyboard, but, um, it did remind me to ask you about just MIDI, you know, sometimes we're like, yeah, this is cool, but I can yep. only play two notes on this. 
what if we want to like you know play a real keyboard? What what kind of options or limitations are we going to run into? Yeah, so you, you've got some really good options. So like I mentioned at the start, any of your class compliant MIDI keyboards, which is virtually all of them now, will actually plug in and you don't even need an audio interface or a microphone because again, you're just sending data. So you're just sending your, your data from your, your MIDI keyboard into GarageBand and then you're just recording it on a virtual instrument. And, and GarageBand's actually got some pretty amazing virtual instruments. So the, the, the piano that they sample in there is like a something ridiculous, like a Steinway, like whatever it is. Uh, so it's actually like digital samples of a really cool piano the same with sort of the string sounds so yes they're synthetic and they're not a real instrument that you're playing but i tell you what you plug in your midi keyboard and you play on those some of those instruments and it sounds pretty amazing and, and in terms of actually getting your performance in there yeah like i say any anything that's sort of a usb midi keyboard that you would plug into your normal computer or you can get midi adapters if you've got sort of older keyboards that have the old five pin din midi connectors a lot of your audio interfaces have midi input as well so you can use those to connect up uh, directly Uh, And then you can send, so there are the the limitations that you mentioned. So if you've got a MIDI controller that's got like drum pads and a whole bunch of different knobs and dials, a lot of those won't be programmable on your phone or on your iPad. But what you do get is your notes and your note velocity, you get sustain, you get your modulation wheel, you get your pitch bend wheel. So you get pretty much everything that you would normally use to put in a performance, whether you're playing a a piano part or whether you just want to play a lead part. So you just want to play like a little bit of an organ or some electric piano, you want a whirly or something in there. Yeah, you can just sort of add it in. and, And again, and it's it's the flexibility. You can have a little twenty five key, you know, fifty dollar keyboard that you want to buy, or you can buy yourself an eighty eight key weighted keys, you know, piano that's a thousand dollars. If they send MIDI, you can plug them in and you can use them. Um, and you said sustain pedal. You can have the sustain pedal in there for these keyboard parts and stuff too, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. So uh, yeah, I've got a sustain pedal I plug into my keyboard, or if I'm if I'm doing a piano based song, so some of my my stuff has sort of a full piano parts. I'll actually go out to my piano, so I've got like a, a Casio Silviana piano. It has a USB plug, and you'll be surprised if you've got a, a decent sort of electric piano that you've bought in the last ten years. It's probably either got a MIDI out or it's got a USB plug. Uh, and again, as long as it's class compliant, so as long as it's reasonably new, uh, then yeah, you can just plug that straight in. And and with that, it takes in the sustain pedal, it takes in all of the performance, and I can play on a, on a decent piano keyboard, like a whole 88 key keyboard, I can record my piano part in and then, yeah, I've got the, the flexibility then of having MIDI that if, like you say, the latency was slightly there, if my timing's off, I can quantize it down to the grid or I can just do some manual editing if there's a few bits that are sticking out. So you get all of that same sort of flexibility that you get on a on any other door. You can do all that with your MIDI and GarageBand. And when you use, it again, that word class compliant, we're talking about uh, allowing a keyboard to, to use a USB cable to go in. But if you already have an interface that's talking to your iPhone and it has a MIDI, yep. like a traditional MIDI jack on it, then you could probably mm-hmm. hook up any, you know, MIDI cable to any old keyboard and that would work, right? Absolutely, yeah. So if, if if you're doing it at that end, so if it's sending MIDI and then your your interface is doing the work to, to kind of convert the signal, then yeah, if it's if it's sending a MIDI signal and then you're grabbing in, then and your device, your interface is class compliant, then that can send it. And that's why if you're starting out, like the, the device I recommend for absolute beginners or, or people that are just getting into this is the Steinberg devices, because the, the UR12 is like one mic pre, one quarter inch jack, and then plugs in via USB and is powered separately. So it does everything you need it. The next model's up, so the UR22 mic two or the UR44 have all of that, but they also have MIDI uh, and they also have like multiple headphone outputs. So yeah, you can, the, I, don't, I, I use the Steinberg so I can recommend them, but it's the same with your yeah, Focusrite, with your yeah, uh, um, yeah, M-Audio, like any of those interfaces that will be class compliant that are pretty new, you're going to be able to plug and play and, and yeah, use all of your, the same stuff. that if, you, if you've already got your own setup and you want to just uh, enhance it or, or use it over on your iPad or your iPhone, you can pretty much just unplug and plug back in and most of the stuff that you're used to will work. Have you seen um, the PreSonus interfaces working with it as well? Uh, the PreSonus, the newer ones, so the Audio Box, I think, is, is sort of their, their sort of consumer level ones. Uh, mm-hmm. Have some of the the higher end stuff. Uh, I'm not sure. So like the Studio Lives and that sort of thing. Uh, I I've, I haven't actually tried any of those out yeah. yet. But uh, again, it just depends on the age. So most most companies about five years ago realized that people wanted like iOS music production was kind of blowing up. So most of the manufacturers made sure that their devices were class compliant around about then. So it's really only if you get the really early sort of M Audio stuff or 
or some of the earlier pre-sona stuff may not be. But yeah, m- most of the gear that, that you get now, and, and I'm kind of in the middle of, of doing that at the moment. It's, it's hard because I don't want to go out and buy every single interface. But uh, every time I talk to someone using it, I say, hey, what are you using? Uh, is it class compliant? And have you used it on your, your iPad or your iPhone? Because eventually I want to bring together a whole database that just says, I, I want to try this interface. Will it work or won't it work? So that's, uh, I guess, the ultimate aim to have that guide. People uh, will be asking. Go to. Yeah, at future NAM events, I'll be going up and saying, excuse me, is this Pete Johns approved? <laughs> this device here? And they'll be like, oh, yeah. Pete John's approved. It'll be Pete compliant. Pete compliant. All right. So Pete, uh, you are on fire, man. You're such a great talker that I know we're going to just blast through these outro questions. So I'm just going to hit them, (laughs) hit them and, and you go, man. Um, if you're ready. So when you started out in recording, what do you feel like was holding you back? Uh, in a word, uh, life, <laughs> and I think we talked about this quite a bit, so, but yeah, just just being able to manage my time. So being able to find the time for music, and again, when you've got a full-time job, when you've got a family, when you've got bills to pay, it can be hard to find that time. So uh, getting getting hold of time management was, was really the big thing for me, and finding finding ways to actually get some more time for music, uh, and, and I had, to, uh, to be honest, I had to make some sacrifices. So what actually got me over that was they're going, okay, what am I doing that's actually not adding a heap of value? So uh, for, for me, it was, you know, the, the three-hour Netflix binges on a, on a Friday night. I'm like, if I convert that three yeah. hours of Netflix to three hours of recording, uh, how am I going to feel much better about myself? And, uh, and yeah, playing the, I'm a big gamer too. So the, the, the PlayStation uh, is now gathering dust because I had to, I had to cut <laughs> myself off. Uh, because yeah, yeah, again, if you want to do things that are fine and, and you still do need things outside of music for sure, you don't want to just you know, spend every waking hour that you're not working doing music or you'll start to think that that's a job yes, as well. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and when you're not doing that, just be listening to recording studio rock stars. And, uh, uh, but yeah, just finding that time to do that is really cool. Uh, and that, that sort of got me over, but that was definitely holding me back at the start was, I guess, making excuses and saying, I'm too busy or I don't have enough time to do it. Make the time, get it, get it done. And, and that, it worked for me. So yeah, I hope that's the, the advice I give other folks. Yeah. Dig it, man. All right. Now, so how about some of the best advice that you received? Uh, apart from, of course, the advice I've received from you early on, Lynch, uh, which was all, <laughs> which all amazing. Which from my guests anyway, right? <laughs> um, actually, the, one of the coolest things, so uh, really early on, um, Bobby Osinski, who I know you've uh, you've had on the show yeah. here at least once, if not a couple of times, a uh, re- really cool guy, absolute guru of the recording world. Uh, he, he asked the question at the end of all of his uh, podcasts, which is, uh, what's the best piece of business advice you've ever gotten? So uh, you know, I, I emailed Bobby one day saying, uh, Bobby, you asked that question to everyone. What is your best piece of advice, just generally, that you would give me? Uh, and he came back and said that perseverance wins. Nice. So I, I, I keep that in mind all the time now, that perseverance, whether it's in music or life or whatever you're doing, there's plenty of people that get really excited. They go really hard, really early. They don't see the success or get the, the, the success that they want. And then they just let things fall away. The people that are actually going to keep going and that keep pushing through and that keep failing and getting up and going again, they're the ones that are going to go. So talent is good. Ability is good. But perseverance is going to win over all those things because if you persevere, you're going to learn, you're going to improve, you're going to get better. And and you know, I, I apply this not only to music but even to my YouTube and my video creation. Like when I was you know, putting videos out and three people were watching them in, in, in a week, uh, it's really hard to get up and make your next video. And, and it's the same with your music. If you think that you're not performing, it's really hard to make your next song but Mm. if you keep doing it it will get better and and you will get better success it helps if you really like looking at yourself on a video or (laughs) listening to yourself (laughs) off of your phone too right and also i appreciate you uh, because perseverance is going to win as we continue to persevere with more questions and get more secrets (laughs) from you Pete johns so uh, how about sharing a recording tip hack or secret sauce something the rock stars could use on their next mobile recording session uh, yeah, so this is a, a bit of a weird one. It's probably not so much a, a tip or a hack, but well, I guess a, a little bit is. So I talked a little bit before about having time pressure and being able to uh, give yourself a, a, a task in a certain amount of time to do something can actually make you just get on and do it. You said the same thing, like when you book the studio time, you better have some songs ready to record. Otherwise, you, you, you know, you're wasting yours and a bunch of people's time. So I, I do something I call speed writing. Um, I didn't make it up. I probably stole it from Joe Gilder or someone else that does the same, same sort of thing. But put 30 minutes on the clock, grab a guitar or an instrument or your voice or whatever you want, hit record on GarageBand and just go. So yeah. just write whatever is in your head. And it doesn't matter if, if it's bad or if it's cheesy or if it's horrible, All it's probably better. even better. 
Yeah, just get it down. Get it out of you because two things, if it's really bad, you can trash it. No one ever needs to know. But you might actually get some little gems in there of gold that you can use in another project or you might write an amazing song or you might get a melody line that you're like, okay, the rest of this song totally sucked, but that melody line is super cool. I'm going to grab that and use that in another track. So yeah, just giving yourself – and again, there's nothing wrong with noodling. So I love to grab a guitar. You know, you sit there for about an hour and then you're like watching the clock. Oh, wow, I've been here for an hour just randomly playing, like you said before, those same chords progressions that you you always seem to pick yeah. up and play on a guitar but if you if you give yourself 30 minutes and you go i'm going to produce something well then it kind of puts that positive pressure on you to actually say i need to have something at the end i need to produce something in the next 30 minutes how am i going to do that so yeah that's, that's a good little hack that i've used and, and i've written whole songs where i've got you know 80 of the song written in 30 minutes and then it's just oh great now I've, I'm, I'm almost there i could just go away and, and hone it and refine it from there i kind of feel like also give yourself permission to do those musical things that you would never do. That's not you. Like mm. I think mm-hmm. about all the times I've listened to some famous band sing some song and I'm like, how did they get away with that line? It's it's like, it's so cheesy, but it's so great because it really works, you know, or something yeah. like that. And then totally. I think I could never do it. But when you give yourself that pressure and you're just like, you know what, I'm going to sing, you know, something from the heart. Uh, sometimes you listen back later, and also if it's only thirty minutes, it's a lot easier to listen back to what you did than if it's two hours of jamming, and you can totally. be really surprised as you're like, "Hey, wait a minute, uh, that sounds pretty good when I sing that too," you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it's really cool, and even even filming is like you said. If you like looking at yourself, I, I don't love it, but I've come to terms <laughs> with it. But uh, put put your iPhone and put your camera on yourself and play it because there's nothing worse than getting something really cool down and then going, "How the heck did I play that part?" If you've got yourself like zoomed Ooh. in on your fingers on your guitar, you're like, "Oh yeah, that that's how I pulled that it's together." So. That could be very cool, too. I need that help a lot because I'll do weird voicings or strange tunings. <laughs> um, all right, so now how about sharing a favorite hardware tool for the studio? I know the answer is going to be iPhone. Say iPhone. Say iPhone. Uh, I've, no, uh, it's not actually. Uh, it, it is related to. So assuming that you have an iPhone or an iPad because uh, yeah, that's that, that's sort of what I'm talking about here and that's that's definitely my jam. But the, the, the favorite hardware tool I have, and I talked about it before, and it's the most boring of favorite hardware tools, but it's the the Lightning to USB 3 cable. It's the absolute essential thing for, for, you, for your uh, iPhone and your iPad creating. It's way over priced so it costs something like forty dollars <laughs> us it's like sixty dollars here in australia to buy this cable but you buy it once and then you've got it forever so and, and don't uh, buy the knockoff don't but i i tried it so I, I tried it so you don't have to i did i did a video where i'm like i'm compared the 50 dollar i uh, apple cable to a three dollar ebay cable uh yeah let's just say it worked but uh, as soon as i updated ios it stopped working so wow. uh, the problem with apple things is that yeah they don't like things that are not compliant with their their world so yeah go out and buy the cable but the, the reason it's cool is that yeah one lightning connection straight into your phone and this is that cable i keep talking about that it's like i unplug and i walk out of the studio so i have everything plugged in through usb and then it's just that one one cable that goes USB to Lightning, and the, the, the USB 3 version of it has a Lightning uh, power connection as well, so you can actually plug that yeah. in, just make get sure that your phone one, or your right? iPad's powered. Get that one, yeah. Like, just, just do it. I don't know. Everyone, on my video, all the down comments are just like, this is too expensive, this is Apple like, yeah, charging too much for something so simple. Yeah, you're probably right, but if you want to record <laughs> on your iPhone or your iPad, it's kind of the, the way to do it. And like I say, once once you've got it, it, it you'll be amazed. You, you, you'll find different things. I, I connected a USB keyboard the other day and was using the, the keyboard shortcuts on GarageBand on, on my phone, which is uh, pretty phenomenal. But uh, yeah, you can connect a lot of USB stuff to, to your iPhone or your iPhone. Yeah, and sometimes the, the amount of time that you uh, spent complaining about the price of that cable and and not spending the money you just missed out on like three new song ideas you could have put down if you just had gotten it you know gotten it hooked up exactly or yeah like you say it cuts out because it says accessory not supported halfway through your your very cool vocal that you know was going to be the 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 take that you nailed it so you you don't (laughs) want that you want something reliable that's going to connect you and, and keep you connected all right so now how about sharing a favorite software tool uh, it, it's hard not to say GarageBand, of course, but I'm not going to because of uh, people already are pretty aware that I'm a big fan of GarageBand and and all of the other the DAWs that are on iOS. But uh, what what I, I haven't mentioned much, I did you, you called it out before, is Final Touch. So this is an iPad only app, so it's not available on the iPhone because mostly because uh, it's a mastering suite. So it would be so small on the iPhone that it'll be really hard to adjust all of your different uh, different dials and knobs there. But uh, it, it's basically it's a, a mastering suite that has like all the the standard components that you would use in 
any sort of mastering uh, for a song. So what I do with Final Touch is I, I send it over from GarageBand into Final Touch as a as a 24-bit uh, 44k WAV file, and then I do my mastering. So you've got your, your EQ, so you've got a really nice EQ because one of the the challenges with GarageBand is this EQ is quite limited, but the EQ in Final Touch is a full mastering EQ. So you've got a whole bunch of bands, you've got a whole bunch of different uh, ways that you can adjust your cues. You can then push it through a reverb if you want, which I don't use much in mastering, but but it's there if you if you need it. You've got like a multi-band compressor then, so you can actually do some really cool multi-band compression to to really sort of make your mix pop. Uh, and then you've got uh, the limiter at the end, so you've got a nice brick wall limiter at the end because one of the things, and I actually did a video recently about this as well. One of the things that GarageBand does is it, it auto normalizes your tracks. So b- because a lot of folks are creating in GarageBand and they just want to, you know, they, they'll mix it together, and and Apple probably want to make sure that people aren't putting songs out there that are like at really low volumes and not competitive. So they lift the volume up like mm-hmm. automatically, uh, which is okay. But if you want to master a track, like you want it, you want some headroom. So you want a little bit of space before you're sort of clipping and hitting zero dB. So what I tend to do is turn the volume down to try and sort of work around that, then send it to Final Touch, and then I'll put the brick wall limiter on there. And that way you can get a really nice, uh, without sort of crushing it. If Ian Shepard's listening, Ian, I don't try to crush my mixes. <laughs> you need some dynamic range. Uh, so I don't want to, I don't want a sausage. I don't want it to be completely, uh, completely limited. But you, yeah, you can still get. And the difference you get between a, a mastered or a not mastered track, and it, it, yeah, it can just be phenomenal. And for again, for a twenty dollar app that you run on your iPad, to be able to take your file and to be able to do those mastering tweaks and have complete control over that is actually pretty amazing. And, and I know there's a lot of folks that uh, are beginners that are using it because it's got a heap of cool presets. But then more experienced folks, again, you can dive into the multi band compressor and really pull out frequencies and, and do a bunch of cool stuff. So that is one to check out if you uh, are in the uh, in the business of mastering your own song. Oh, we didn't even ask this question. How much is GarageBand for the iPhone? GarageBand is zero dollars and zero cents or what? zero pounds, zero pence. Yeah, right. One hundred percent free. So it used to cost you about five bucks, and then Apple realized that hey, if I give this to everyone, that everyone's going to use it. So uh, yeah, from about three years ago, zero dollars available. Download from the App Store, completely free. Very cool. All right, um, let's keep jumping through. Uh, you know, I don't know what element of business you want to talk about, but, um, you know, do you have any tips or resources for the business side of either making music or maybe just, you know, running your YouTube channel or, or maybe Ooh. just your other job, whatever it is, whatever you want to share. Yeah, sure. Uh, so my, my resource for the business part is actually YouTube. So and I know a lot of folks use YouTube in this way or, or use YouTube as part of their, their strategy if they're a musician. But really, regardless of what you do, if you're running any sort of business or even if you're running a hobby or your music as a hobby, you kind of need to be on YouTube these days. And even if it's not to make money, because obviously YouTube, you can make money. There is ad revenue to, to be had if, if you've got a, a successful channel. But just so that folks can actually have a one place to go that is just video that is just your stuff. So if you're a business, you want to pack it with like, here's what my business does. Here's how you can interact with my business. Here's how the how to's that are related to my field of business. But the reason number two to be on YouTube is it's actually, in my opinion, the best place to network and learn from other folks who, who are perhaps doing the same things that you're doing, or maybe they're doing things you want to be doing and you can actually tap in with them and, you know, Case in point is that we're having a chat here today. Like if, uh, if it wasn't for YouTube, if it wasn't for, for me watching your videos, you watching my videos, maybe we wouldn't be chatting here today. So I think YouTube is great because you can you can get your business out there, whether it's a business or your music or your studio or whatever, but it's also a great place to meet other folks and, and network with other people as well. It wasn't YouTube, man. It was the purple t-shirt. Hey, <laughs> if you had bought one more purple t-shirt, I was about to call you and invite you on the show anyway. So that, there you go. Uh, rock stars, if you want to come on Lidge's show, just buy a T-shirt and uh, <laughs> invite you on it. Oh, man. We're in for it now. <laughs> all right, dig it. How about an organizational resource? Any any tips on keeping all your uh, shit together? Uh, yeah, yeah. So so I use, um, I use OneNote, actually. And I know a lot of folks use Evernote. A lot of folks use whatever it is, whatever system you have. But I guess the key thing here is to have something that, because I'm a, a mobile user primarily, uh, I needed something that's synced across all of my devices. So I, I'm, I used to be a bit of an organizational junkie, and I kind of had to take a bit of a chill pill uh, and not be as organized because I found I was spending all my time organizing and none of my time doing. Uh, but yeah, I, I still use that because I can put everything in there 
there. I can put my lyric ideas, my song ideas. I can snap photos and put them in there and then sync them across to, to all of my devices. All of my video ideas for, for YouTube can go in there as well. And they're just all categorized under different categories. So if I'm if I'm out and about and I'm like, oh, I really want to do a video or, I'm, or on this on this podcast, I've already made a couple of notes saying, oh, yeah, Lidge said that you know, he asked about this question. That'd be a great video idea. I need to make a video about yeah how to increase the number of bars on your GarageBand track. Like that oh, goes yeah. in the OneNote document. Then then I just go back there and I'm like, oh, what, what do I make a video about? I've, I've never got that problem. I got maybe a hundred things there that I've got a backlog of ideas. So That's yeah, good. to me, just having some note taking app that syncs across everything. Yeah, you, you'd be gold. You use Google Docs, Evernote, whatever it is, as long as it it syncs across everything, you'd be cool. Okay, dig it. Now um, I like to ask a question about you know having a simple setup, finding people, making ends <laughs> meet. But let's narrow that that one that question down. So I think in this yep. case, the simple setup is going to be you know your iPhone. Oh, yeah. Let's focus on finding people to make music with. What what tips do you have for the rock stars? You mentioned some things already, but maybe we'll re-mention them here. How should they find more people to make music with, maybe in the iPhone GarageBand world or maybe just, you know, in some other world to make music with? Yeah, so... Uh... We, we are really lucky that we live in the time that we do because I can sit here in Adelaide, uh, in, you know, thousands of miles away from from most other folks that are recording, and I can still interact with them. And, and I do that because there is uh, Facebook forums, there's Reddit forums, there's uh, you know, YouTube channels, and there's ways to actually connect with people. So uh, I use Facebook a lot. Uh, so there's a lot of really good resources on Facebook, a lot of good groups. So Facebook groups, there's recording groups. There's If you name a piece of software, so if you're on Reaper, there's a big Reaper group that I'm part of. If you're using GarageBand, there's a big GarageBand group, Logic, Pro Tools, it doesn't matter. There's going to be a community of other people that are doing the stuff you're doing and that are making the thing. And then there's the more general just songwriter groups and and, uh, and musician groups. So uh, it's really cool to be able to do that. If, if you're looking for local though, this is the funny thing, is that in, in the GarageBand users group, there's 3,000 members. Uh, I found two other guys that live like a few kilometers from my house. So uh, the, you can find people that are local to you so you can go global and then you can sort of pare it down and find people in these big global communities that are also local that you can then catch up with and you can start chatting with. So yeah, that's my recommendation for the people side. It's just a a few kilometers, just an iPhone's throw away. Exactly. Yeah. You can just lob (laughs) lob your iPhone over there and uh, you'll you'll hit someone else that's using GarageBand. They do an overdub (laughs) and they throw it back to you. (laughs) <laughs> All right, so we're going to, this hypothetical question, this last one, we're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine. You're going to go back and find yep. a young Pete, um, what was it, on Walkabout somewhere, <laughs> and, and you tap yourself on the shoulder and uh, you say, hey, listen, man, I've come back to tell you this. This is the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the recording studio yourself one day, young Pete on Walkabout. What would you tell yourself? Yeah, what what I would tell myself is to keep creating music and keep finding time for music. So uh, I know a lot of your rock stars would be doing music full time, but I'm sure there's a heck of a lot of them like me that are that have to have a, an income somewhere else uh, and have to sort of make ends meet and and maybe struggling to find time for music. So uh, w- what I would say to myself is that uh, doesn't matter how much time you have or what you're doing, just keep creating because probably and, and I don't have a lot of regrets because it's not worth it. I tend to be a a now and a future kind of person, a pretty positive person, but if there was one thing that I would have done differently, it was that I think about those sort of missing 20 years between about ages 18 and, and sort of 38 and go, yeah, if I had been doing some sort of music, even if I'm just writing songs, writing lyrics, uh, you know, recording something on uh, keep uh, my Tascam, get my Tascam four track happening and had a whole bunch of four track recordings, like would that, that would have got me further than I am today. But I guess the flip side of that, though, is that the best time to start something is right now. So if there's something that's holding you back, uh, yeah, you can look back and go, gee, I wish I'd done that. Or you can say, hey, the best time to start is now. Let's not waste another second or another minute and just get into it and start going. It's that that age old adage, the best time to write a song is 20 years ago and the next best time is right now. Spot on. You got it. All right, dude. (laughs) Uh, Pete Johns, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. We've been going for a solid two hours, and like you have <laughs> not missed a beat, man. You have shared so many cool tips about making records on your mobile device, specifically on your iPhone with GarageBand. How can mm-hmm. the rock stars find you online, and where do they go if they want to learn more about you and uh, just follow, you know, start making records on their mobile device? 
Yeah, sure. So if you head over to studiolivetoday.com, uh, that's got all of my YouTube videos there. It's how to follow me. You can got my Facebook, my Twitter, all of the places that you can connect with me are there on studiolivetoday.com. And if you want to specifically hear what music recorded on an iPhone or an iPad can sound like, you can head to petejohns.com uh, and you can check out my uh, my album that I recorded last year, Selfish Aware, and all of my other singles and EPs are all linked there for you to take a listen. Uh, just to remind us again, how many records you've made? And let's let's back up. For a long time, you weren't doing that music. You weren't, and then you started, <laughs> and then you just said, "I'm just going to make some records and use my iPhone." How much content have you already created with your iPhone? Yeah, so so in two and a half years, I've got uh, an album, an EP, and nine singles at this stage, and 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 still counting. So yeah, I've I've been producing pretty much something every every month, uh, or if not every couple of months, and and getting it out there. And I think that's the the beauty part of the the creation world that we live in these days is yeah. that you can you can connect to people, you can record it, you can release it. And we didn't talk much about sort of the releasing side, but that's something that I, I say to folks all the time is that get your music out there. If it's if it's just a YouTube clip or if it's on sound cloud or if it's uh if you actually want to release it to you know to spotify and apple music then get it out there because you know I've, it sounds a bit cheesy but art isn't art until someone else is experiencing it so if mm. you're creating art you're creating music you want other people to be able to experience it that's why when i say you, know, you want to create your music you want to record your music but you also want to release it don't forget that final stage which is you're releasing and and rockstars the encouragement here isn't that you know you should go make your music and it should sound like pete's music or sound like lidge's music who cares mm. about that? It's just that mm. just go out and make your music. This is a tool that that like removes the excuses for you not doing those songs that you've been wanting to do. So it's fantastic, exactly. Pete. Thanks so much, man. An absolute pleasure hanging with you. I look forward to chatting with you again soon. Um, and I guess we will see you around the Apple Store or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. We wallet in hand. Thanks for that, Lynch. Awesome, dude. Cheers, man. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. Also, remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com. Look for the link in the show notes. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio, all totally free. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.